And I'm just very excited to be moving on and getting ready to work with kids full time. What's your concentration? Uh, percussion. Percussion, thank you. Mm -hmm. thank you. Hello, my name is Kaylee Whitener. I'm also at Baker University, and I'm also a music education major, but my emphasis is in vocal. Um, I'm current, yeah. <laughs> uh, I'm currently at Mission Trail Middle School in Olathe, Kansas. That's where I'm at right now. We're doing choir stuff, preparing for our musical. So that's been pretty cool. And I'm super excited to join the profession. And I already have my sub license, so I'm starting that in in January. So yes, excited. And I'm Mackenzie Garber. I also went to Baker University. I am not music ed. <laughs> I am um, secondary with an English focus, and I am student teaching at Eudora High School, and will probably look for a job around that area. I also have my sub license, so we may have to start out with that, but no matter what, we'll, we'll see um, what's open here after graduation. So thanks for having us today. <laughs> Appreciate you being here. Uh, this is probably not the most exciting thing that you'll do in your academic training, but we appreciate you coming. Uh, we've had, over the years since I've been here, we've regularly had students from Becker University, and we appreciate you being here, and we appreciate the, uh, the fact that, uh, that, you're work, that you're moving into what we consider to be a very honorable, exciting and profession that can actually change the lives of people. Thank you very much for your dedication and your willingness to step in. Are there any changes to today's agenda? If not, a motion would be in order. Jim McNeese moves that we approve the agenda. Is there a second to that motion? Melanie makes the seconds the motion. All in favor, please raise your hand. That was the. Is that everybody? Okay, the motion carries. Yeah, I saw Betty. Are there any additional corrections to the minutes of October the 12th or 13th? If not, a motion would be in order to approve the agenda, I mean approve the minutes, and that's Ben Jones, and the second is Jean. All in favor, please raise your hand. All opposed, motion carries unanimously. At this time, we welcome the commissioner. Thank you, Mr. Porter. It's good to see all of you and uh, Ms. Arnold. It's good to see you too, only virtually. Uh, we're here to celebrate today the remarkable success of many school districts uh, in our star recognition program. Uh, we'll formally honor them next week at our annual conference, but uh, this is the day that we're uh, uh, giving you of that information. Peggy's going to uh, pass out to you uh, a listing of these districts in three different ways, by category, alphabetically, and then by school district number. So you'll have those in three different ways uh, as we go over it. And I know you're going to be scaring through that looking for your school district. So um, we'll, uh, we'll have a lot of opportunities. I think today is a day for you to be proud of the school districts in your region as we talk about the remarkable accomplishments. I, th I think it's also as you go back and you talk to them, please say to them, wow, you know, we just acknowledged you in this area or these areas, and then challenge them, you know, let's get better, right? Let's, let's do both. And, and I think sometimes that's really hard in our profession is acknowledging the great work and then acknowledging there's still work yet to be done. And we still have uh, a lot of work yet to be done. So today, uh, as we think about the success of each student, we're really talking about the high, high levels of student success that you have set across the state. And I, I can't say this enough. I, I mentioned this Saturday morning um, at KSB uh, this past week. You have set a standard in each of these areas that is extremely high because you're trying to drive the success of students after they leave the K-12 system. And to do that, you have to have standards that actually try 
to guarantee that as much as possible, right? Anytime you're working with uh, people, there, there's never a guarantee on that, but you've tilted the odds to do that work. So I shared this with you before I, I share it with you again. When you talk to school districts, and this is really our KISA process, but it's any process, does that school district have a plan and a process in place to ensure that each child can be successful? That's something as you visit, they may call it a strategic plan or process you should ask. The part that you have really no control over is their execution of that plan. That is a local decision. They've got to go execute that plan. Some would argue that right now, the Kansas City Chiefs are not executing very well. Because, and obviously there's a competition there. What's, what's really neat about the execution of this is for the Anthony Harper Chaparral School District to do well, Kingman does not have to do poorly. You know, last week, for the Chiefs to win, the Packers had to lose, right? But that's not true. But, but the standard's really high, but they have to execute. That is a local, that's what the local boards have got to hold all people uh, to. And then you're measuring, which we're celebrating today, those eight outcomes. Oh, those eight outcomes at the highest of levels. This, this is not a participation trophy or ribbon. No, not everyone gets to be recognized today. Okay? So as you look at the Kansas Can Star recognition, you will see that you have several different layers here, copper, bronze, silver, or gold, and a diamond. Diamond is set aside for if at any time, and we think there will be at some point, a school district hits every outcome at the gold level. That would be a diamond award school district. These are school districts. Of course, at this point, we don't have any, as you'll see even uh, with some of the gold. So to be at gold, we have some quantitative areas, and we have some qualitative. You can see there the areas. I'm not going to go through all those, but you can see the levels. All of those represent what would be the highest levels, um, like 95% would, would set that to be the highest level of any state in the country on graduation rate and any country actually in the world. And we have some districts achieving that. Here's just a sample district of what it might look like uh, as it relates to um, how a district may be recognized in some areas and not others, with the goal of obviously trying to find this balance that make up student success. Because as you know, all the research says that we're trying to have the skill sets then that lead uh, young people into post-secondary attainment without the need for remediation. So here's the medal stamp. I mentioned this before. If you get to the Olympics, you're an elite athlete. Just getting there, right? To get on the medal stand at the Olympics is a really rare feat. But we tend not to remember in our society those that got a silver medal, unless you know the, the family or the people, or a bronze, the gold medalist, we, you know, we tend to remember. But any of these levels are really hard to achieve and really hard to obtain and get to. So we're going to be recognizing all of these levels today. So let's start with graduation. First, there are 18 districts that perform between a level of 88.4 to 88.9, those are copper level. There are 35 districts that are over 90%. There are 25 districts over 93%. So if you just looked at that, before we even get to the gold, there are 60 school districts that have a graduation rate between over 90%, but not quite at 95%. Pretty good. But these school districts are all over 95%. And so you'll see this come up, and I want you just to look at that and reflect, because each one of those, from Easton, as I just look at some, to Golden Plains, to uh, the Kansas City Catholic Diocese, but you'll see public and private 
shown here, two blue valleys that we have in Kansas. Uh, you look at this, and I hope it means something to you because this is hard work that, that they have this achievement uh, in, in front of them. Here's the remainder of that list because this is alphabetical. And you again can see private, public school districts all have achieved a 95% graduation rate. All here have achieved that. Can everyone achieve a 95% graduation rate? Yes. Again, for Sylvan Grove to win this award, Stockton does not have to lose the award. That is the major difference. But the level doesn't move. How do you get more people to gold immediately? Lower from 95 to 90, right? But then that wouldn't be what would lead the world and would certainly not be what students need to go on to be successful. So... Congratulations to those at that level. Now let's talk about academically prepared for post-secondary. All right, again, if someone said, well, what's the goal? The goal is to be academically prepared that you can exercise any option after high school. So think about this. You've set that, all right, you've got a, a math assessment, you've got an English language arts assessment, you have a science assessment, and the people that are being recognized today are showing high levels of academically preparing those students in all three of those categories, every grade level of those categories uh, across the system. So there's 171 districts achieved at the copper, that's public and private. You can see the bronze level here. And by the way, I'm gonna point out Haviland. Haviland is one of our school districts that is a little unique. There are a handful of these in the state. They do not have a high school. They are a K-8 school district. Janet and I were talking about that. There used to be a lot of those across the state. There's not very many today, but you can see clearly um, that, uh, that, that, that they are there. And uh, so you can see the copper and bronze. And then we want to give a shout out to the school district that's really doing an outstanding job here. Because to be at the gold level, you have to have 75%. We have, as you'll see in many of these areas, there are not participants, school districts at the gold level. That is true here. But Fort Leavenworth is the highest achiever we have in this category. We had no one at that, at that stage a year ago. So we give a lot of congratulations, especially during a time of pandemic when, as I mentioned, we've, we've seen a lot of these measures go down. Let's take a look at post-secondary effectiveness. Doesn't make any sense if, you, again, a conversation Janet and I had today. We start this state. We have, by the 1920, 10,000 one-room schoolhouses, housing grades one through eight. Most people don't go to high school. By the 1950s, we're still not quite at 50% going to high school, but that number's going up. And now today we know that well over 70% of our kids need to graduate high school and earn something else beyond high school, a welding certificate or an LPN or a four-year degree in teaching like the young people that were here before you. So here are the school districts that scored at least over 50% uh, on the post-secondary effectiveness, 44 districts, over 50, 48 districts at the bronze level, 52 districts at the silver, over 60%. And here are the public and private systems that are over 70% graduation and going on past high school to earn something else. This number uh, is also up. Now, remember our, our post-secondary effectiveness is measuring up to 2019. So again, congratulations to these districts. As you know, I'm very excited about something that we call the Commissioner's Award because in every school district, we layer a metric on them that measures several different items, but the major ones are how much poverty does that school district have? 
no surprise, the district with the largest poverty in our state is Kansas City, Kansas. We also have some small school districts that have very large poverty also, so I don't want you to think it's just the large, but Kansas City, Kansas. School districts with the least poverty are those generally in the suburbs around the Kansas City area or around the Topeka area, around the Wichita area, Blue Valley would be one of those, or Goddard, Andover, et cetera. So we look at everyone's poverty and we, we know that that's an, a factor on having them overcome success. They have to overcome that to really gain and do well. Chronic absenteeism is the other factor we look at. How many kids are missing more than 10% of the days of school? And then what's the mobility? How many kids move in and out of Scott City in a given year? How, how often do they change schools? Those three risk factors are the three biggest risk factors a school district will have. And so when we look at the data on a bell-shaped curve, most of our school districts fall in between. What we're going to honor in the Commissioner's Award are those school districts that are doing better in graduation and sending kids on to some education past high school than what we would predict them to do based upon their risk factors. So, again, I want you to think that Janet's heard me use this analogy a lot, because I, but I think it's appropriate. Kansas City Turner and Kansas City Piper are fairly close to each other, but they serve very different populations of students and families. They just do. So when we look at Turner or we look at Piper, Turner has greater risk factors than Piper has, so we would expect the Piper school district to do better than the Turner based upon those, even though we, what we just recognized was a static view. Commissioners takes that into account, right? So first, the commissioner's award are uh, 0.4 to 0.9 standard deviations beyond the mean. The ones with honors exceed what we would predict by a full standard deviation. And then there's some remarkable school districts that just simply beat the odds and do a great job with two standard deviations beyond the mean. And as I'm going through these today, what you will notice is that these aren't always the same schools in any of these categories year after year after year. So 69 school districts outpaced their graduation and post-secondary effectiveness by a standard deviation of at least 0.4 to 0.9. 36 went over one standard deviation, and there were two school districts, public, private, and state of Kansas, that knocked it out of the park and have the highest distinction. I'll be going to these two school districts. Plainville, just north of Hayes, and Pike Valley, a school district just south of Belleville in north central Kansas. And those two school districts, you'll notice, were not on that a year ago. They are out producing their risk factors by two standard deviations. And uh, we want to congratulate them for overcoming the odds and doing a great job uh, on that. For many of you, you know, the Challenge Awards rewarded buildings in a very similar way, those that were overcoming the odds. This does this at a district level. Individual plans of study. Who's doing that really well? Well, you've heard from some of those just recently. Here are the districts that received copper. Again, you'll, you'll notice that, again, not very many school districts being recognized, as this is difficult to achieve, but congratulations to all of these, including Nemaha Central at the, the silver level, and one school district, public-private, at the um, gold level, Piper, and you heard from them just a month or two ago about the work that they're doing, trying to help every child be successful post high school. Social emotional growth, those uh, employability skills, those interpersonal skills that are so important. Tons of research on this related to both increasing academic achievement and then also increasing the likelihood that young people will go on to be successful. Here are the school districts that 
I got on the metal stand uh, at the copper level and the bronze level. You'll notice some new uh, on there that, again, we haven't seen before. Maybe a, uh, just a quick shout out to Humboldt or Jayhawk, uh, Lynn, because they, you know, did a lot of work to get there in the last year. And then at the silver level, you can see those districts. And again, you heard from some of those. No district is at the gold level in, uh, in this area right now. But we'll get there. We'll get there. Kindergarten readiness. Trying to make sure that every kid in communities are ready for the academic and social emotional rigors of kindergarten in, in any way possible that that community deems necessary. And again, you're seeing the top there would be bronze. There's no silver or gold in that area right now. Congratulations again to all of these school districts. Civic engagement, and you're going to get to hear from some of these tomorrow as we're highlighting civic engagement and uh, some things that were being done with Honor Flight. Again, um, there's the uh, ones with copper and the ones with bronze. There are no silver on civic engagement, but we do have one gold level district on civic engagement, and it is Southern Lyon County. Now, I mentioned to you how hard it is to be on the metal stand to do this because you've set the bar extremely high in all these areas that make up, you know, what we're trying to look at to go for, for uh, student success. How about you arrived at the Olympics and you walked away with four medals? Pretty good, huh? It's half of the areas that you measure. That's not, not, not pretty good. It's like really good. <laughs> And so here are the school districts that are being recognized in four areas. Now, they're not all at gold because we have some areas that no one's at gold, but they are on the medal stand uh, in, in each of the four areas. You will see, again, public and private schools. As you're seeing this, you're, you may be thinking again, wow, every school is on this. No, not every public school and every private school is even close to making any of these lists. These are, again, the highest levels. Let me just continue. Again, I just want you to take a look. These are alphabetical. You'll, you're seeing small. You're seeing large. You're seeing um, north, south, east, and west, public, private. Five areas. In my era, I remember a swimmer called named Mark Spitz long before there was... You know, and uh, uh, but we've had people really run the table. Look at the these school districts being recognized in five distinct areas. Six areas of the eight. Six. Again, we only had two last year. Colby now is on that list, Gene. I know you're proud of them and their work. And then there were the people that you remember forever that I guess are on the Wheaties boxes, right? We actually have a school district that is in seven out of the eight areas. South Barber County. Your Kansas geography lesson will, I'm going to mess you up a little bit. That is Kiowa, Kansas which is not in Kiowa County. That's, what, that's what's going to mess you up. South Barber County, seven of the areas. And then yesterday I had the distinct pleasure of virtually talking to a school district and their staff on a staff development day because we have a school district that hit every single area of success that you put out. Not all gold, two of them, of this, of the, their eight are at gold but they've made a concerted effort to do what's best for their students and their families in, their, in that district, and it is Southern Lyon County. Told you you'd be excited, Ben. We need to congratulate those school districts. That's a lot of work on their part. They're really trying to do the work um, to, to propel success. You have those in front of you. Uh, we'll be meeting over the next several months to uh, try to take a look at the other side of that, which is those districts that 
could use some assistance. I would also say this to you. Uh, the, the cycle now begins anew for next year. So encourage your school districts that uh, maybe you want to see, um, you know, climb the ladder. Again, go back to what's your process and can we execute at a high level. With that, Mr. Chairman, I'd be happy to answer any questions that you might have. Are there questions? Ann, here. Janet, would you come sit down? Thank you. I think so. Yeah, Can you hear me? That. Okay. Uh, thank you, Commissioner. I really appreciate that. And I, you and I had a conversation about, um, you know, what's upcoming with the legislature and how people are talking about our school success. And uh, I know we hear the term proficient thrown around a lot, but I think what you explained to me is that is only a term that we define for federal purposes and every state defines it differently. Is that right? That is correct. And it's only a term applied to academic success. Mm -hmm. It's not a term that you'll find applied to civic engagement or you'll apply, apply to graduation. But on academic, the federal government says you have to have a term called proficient. Every state sets that cut score different. I think what you have done, and maybe not uh, the right thing to do politically, was set that extremely high yeah. and then set the cut score. I say you, Kansas teachers did that. Right. But you did that because that ensures, by all the measures we have, that a student would be academically ready to go on. Right. I mean, I, from the chart we saw last month, I think Kansas was – the highest cut scores in the nation. I think if I understand right, like if we said ours where Missouri did, all our twos would be, quote, proficient, right? That is correct. So, um, and I also understand that even, even though proficient's not a term we use for state purposes, um, that if you're a two with those interpersonal and interpersonal competencies that we stress, you'll be fine after college. I mean. Our data indicates that to be correct. Right. Our that, data indicates that, yes. All this just to say, I, I think the public and particularly the legislature is being misled about our real academic results. And I'm trying to think, and maybe we'll talk about this more today, how we can change the conversation now to tell the people the truth about where Kansas is. Well, I think you go back to your definition. We're trying to produce young people that graduate high school with a, with a mixture of skills that they can go on to be successful in post-secondary without remediation mm -hmm. and whatever they choose to do. Uh, that's not what some states' definition, right, of what they're trying right. to accomplish. And so when you look at that and you look at then what we're – it's like uh, – and I think about it like going to the doctor. There's a series of tests that, get, you know, you don't – feel right, something's not right, they do a series of tests, they come up with a diagnosis, they may have a game plan that's tailored to you, but it's, it's a combination of things that end up happening. Um, and so we, we, you are trying to improve those eight outcomes at the highest level, and we're trying to accelerate that improvement. We're trying to do faster, we're trying to accelerate that. Because at the end of the day, 72%, to be exact, of our kids are going to need a high school diploma and something beyond high school. And, you know, when you talk to parents, they, they get that um, a kid's success is more than how they scored on one test on one day. But maybe we just need to be more vocal about the story. Well, and it's not to diminish that they should do well academically. Right, right. And, and yes. And so we've got work to do on all of those areas. Anything else? Uh, Michelle. Oh. Okay, Betty. We can't hear you, Betty. Yes, we can now. at those districts that um, are not um, successful. So my question is, will we be receiving a report 
in terms of that? Are you, and are you looking at uh, interventions or steps or recommendations that could be made to help them get on uh, a track for success? Yes, you have uh, a little bit of that in the opposite of what you have got handed out today on the recognition, Betty, but you, but yes, we will be talking about that. Remember, as a policy, what would you want to do first to ensure success? Set the highest of standards and then try to encourage people to go there with, with local school districts having some autonomy. But yes, we will be talking about which plans look good, how do they execute those plans? And that'll, that'll be not only December, but over the next several months. Anything else? Michelle. Have to pass the mic. Thank you, Chairman Porter. Okay, so just moving forward as far as breaking, breaking everything no, down. Okay, and bre breaking everything down. I'm just thinking of as far as we had, we heard from KBOR recently, as far as the college and, and um, people applying for colleges. I'm curious as to as to the just being accepted into the colleges. How like are, are do we have an increase in community colleges as far as with remediation maybe taking a course over before they go on to college to get that out of the way, get a better score, you know, bring their grade up. I'm just curious if we're seeing more community college increase and a little bit less in the in the college realm and as far as going into college and acceptance how many of these schools that um, are, are seeing kids go off and go into programs where you do have to have a high ACT score or, you, you know, to get into maybe a business program. Like engineering or something. Yeah, yes. yeah. I I'm just curious if those are staying steady. I don't know if I'll we'll be able to know. At least in Kansas, are those staying steady or, or, um, or is just the acceptance just to get into the college? That is that Excellent. down. So I, I'd be curious to see in Kansas, if we can look into that a little bit more, are our, yeah. are our community colleges seeing an increase in enrollment because they need remedi remediation? Um, or, um, and just taking that, because they know they have to have that, they want that piece of paper, or they want they want a special, specialized before they go into, into the colleges. So sure. I'd be curious. So I think we can get the second part, which is what are they going into? Are they going into uh, computer science, engineering, high levels of business, uh, that type of thing. We'd have to get that, Peggy, from KBOR. Michelle, I think the answer to the other uh, is, uh, let me give you a couple and then you can follow up. Last month I shared with you that over the last 10 years, the remedial rate at community colleges is down about 6%. It's also down at the four-year college rate. But also what's down over that time, Michelle, is enrollment in general in community colleges is down. In the last two years, what we've seen during the pandemic, the years of 20 and 21, so I'm talking about the class of 20 and the class of 21, it has fallen off the chart of the number of kids that did not go on anywhere to post-secondary, primarily male. I mean, almost cut in half. So. The remedial rate has dropped at both community colleges and uh, four-year, um, but so has enrollment over that period of time. Um, so what we measure, and I want to be clear on this because this is the way in which we, we all set it up. So you know this, that if a student goes off to college, I've used this example a million times, so my class left high school, went off to Kansas State. I joined a fraternity, and we pledged in that fall, and we initiated in the spring, semester later. Half of those young men were gone. Like they just, we weren't there. They had dropped out. So when we measure post-secondary effective rate, we're only calculating those kids that left high school and are still in school pursuing that degree two years, full two years, or they've already earned it, Michelle. And the reason we were doing that is because we know that the more remedial classes that you need to take, the, like, the likelihood of you dropping out increases. So you've got to diminish that uh, at the same time that you're trying to increase um, academic and, and other skill sets 
in order to do well. Does that help? Yeah, and so we have some kids that have 15 hours of credit. I That's mean, right. Ready to go, I mean, through Baker, I mean, some yes. of them are taking them through CAP, yes. through um, the ba Baker University, through uh, community college. So, um, and that's another thing is I'm sure the success rate of that is high if because they've, they've already earned 15 hours, they're going to probably stay in it, and they've gotten a lot of the requ uh, their requirements out of the way. And it's and low they cost. Go, they can go right into their uh, into their um, major. And, and in some cases, they stay and get it like an MBA, or you know, they may stay. So you're right. So when we, you know, as one of your joint goals with the Kansas Board of Regents is how, how do you get these first 15 credits accessible? Because you can lower cost and those gen eds then can, if you can complete those gen eds, it's the same as going to Cali County and completing those gen eds. It gives you a boost in order to, that you can do the work in order to go on. And it's low cost when it's done in high school and with, with a support system that you don't have to go on to. So yes. And yes. they still have competency tested. I'm sure in a lot of colleges, if you're not doing the ACT, they still have competence, a competency tests that you can take to make sure that you are prepared, prepared correct? That's correct, okay. yes. Okay, I don't want to squelch debate, but the fact is we have to stay on schedule this morning because we have a drop-dead date at 11.15 where we have to be ready for an already prepared, uh, uh, already prepared oral arguments. So... Uh, so we're, we will, we can continue this discussion at some other time, but we're going to have to, to move on. Thank you, Mr. Uh, I now declare the Citizens Open Forum with Kansas State Board of Education meeting open at 10.43 a.m. The State Board provides this opportunity for citizens to share views about topics of interest or issues currently being considered by the State Board. The State Board asks that speakers identify themselves by name and the name of the group they represent, if applicable. The State Board also asks that each speaker focus their remarks on issues or topics. Personal attacks will not be tolerated. Each speaker is limited to three minutes. Any board questions will be for clarification. Our first speaker is Dave Traubert uh, from the Kansas Policy Institute. Welcome, Mr. Traubert. theory is not part of the standards but what takes place in classrooms is completely different from what's in state standards uh, and unfortunately there is ample evidence being uncovered across the state that critical race theory and the tenets of critical race theory are in fact being taught in Kansas schools I'm not going to dwell on that but the handout you're receiving has a few pages of examples of what we've uncovered Parents see through this obfuscation, um, and they also see the effects that things like this are having on student achievement, which uh, is good for a lot of students, but unfortunately for many, it's not, and, and it's getting worse. The 2021 state assessment results uh, show continued decline in student achievement, uh, continuing of what was taking place before the pandemic, and in fact, there are still many more high school students below grade level than are on track for college and career. For example, in math, 47% of high school students are below grade level. That's in level one. Only 20% are on track for college and career. Those are the kids in level three and four. Results for English language arts show 35% below grade level and just 28% on track. The rest are at level two, which is considered at grade level, but not really on track for college and career and needing some degree of remedial training to get there. Now, there are some education officials who are trying to tell parents that level two is actually on track for college and career, uh, but there is no documentation that we've been able to find that this board has approved any change to those standards. And in fact, I would point you to the commissioner's presentation you just heard. Those uh, awards for academic preparedness were based on performance only in levels three and four, not in level two. Uh, now let's look at the large number of students who are below grade level. In 2016, about a quarter of all students were considered to be below grade level. And now, five years later, about a third of students are considered to be uh, below grade level. 
And, and those numbers, by the way, are far worse for kids in high school, which seriously questions the validity of a high school, a, a, a very high high school graduation rate. We know that a lot of kids getting a diploma are below grade level in math and English language arts. Uh, I've had that conversation in front of school superintendents who have not denied it. So I'm going to close by asking you two questions. First, how many years or decades is it going to take Kansas to get kids to grade level? And second, have you changed the official achievement standards? Have you changed the definitions that you improved, approved in 2015? Anyone? I just thought I'd give you the opportunity. Thank you. Thank our speaker. Today, we're sharing with the board, the State Board of Education will determine if any of the issues should be addressed as an agenda item at future meetings. The State Board Open Forum is closed at 1048. And we will now act on recommendations of the Kansas Education Systems Accreditation. Uh, Michelle. Good morning, Chairman Porter, members of the board, Commissioner Watson. I'll wait patiently for the presentation to miraculously appear. And if I may just take a moment to congratulate those systems that Dr. Watson recognized this morning, that is the hard work of those leaders, those teachers, and those community members, and I just wanted to take a liberty to say I appreciate the work that they have done. Uh, with that, I will move on to conversation you heard from Dr. Watson relative to the accreditation process and bring you today recommendations that you heard about last month. As I do every month, I remind you of what uh, the definitions for accredited, conditionally and accredited status, and not accredited. I bring these to you as a reminder. These are the systems that we would bring you today and recommend for action. Uh, Z00299895 St. John Catholic School and a recommendation of accredited. And another private system, Z00649898 Anor Islamic School for a conditionally accredited status. And with that, I would stand for a motion or any questions you may have. We have questions or a motion? I move the Kansas State Board of Education accept the recommendation of the Accreditation Review Council and award the status of accredited to St. John Elementary and the status of conditionally accredited to Anur Islamic. Is there a second to that motion? Dina Horst seconds that motion. Any further discussion? Not all in favor, please raise your hand. All opposed, the motion carries. Thank you. And now we'll look at next month, right? For information, Chairman Porter, I bring to you these systems today. Uh, these are for your review, and you have a great deal of information on the three of them. Z00299014, St. Agnes Catholic School, for a recommendation of accredited. Z00299019, Holy Spirit Catholic School, conditionally accredited. And USD381, Spearville, conditionally accredited. Let me review with you where those systems have been to arrive at your door today. They, uh, the Holy Spirit Catholic School appealed their conditionally accredited decision, and it was noted that the areas for improvement included identification of data in their needs assessment and to support the areas of need. They needed to also be sure that their goal areas were measurable and based on areas of need and student focused. Spearville is also coming to you for information as an appeal. Uh, I'm giving you the information on their status of appeal for accredited, conditionally accredited status. Again, the areas of improvement that the ARC noted were that they identified data in their needs assessment and areas of need. SMART goals, these are specific, measurable, attainable, et cetera, goals that will help the system 
focus its improvement efforts and that they needed to do some continued work on the implementation of a formalized IPS process. As a reminder, we've talked about this before with other systems, implementing a successful IPS system takes a bit of time. And with that, I would stand to answer any questions. I have my good friend Jeanette with me as well if there are questions about these systems. Same question as always, and I'm sure it's here, and I've read it, but it's, I've slept since I've read it. Uh, at what point will the uh, those that are recommended for a, uh, conditional accreditation be able to uh, fulfill the requirements to be reconsidered? The ARC notes that when they ask for their growth and improvement in this area. Typically, they give them the full academic year to do that. Some of these things take longer than others. Um, so, so for the most part, they, they extend that, t that work until June 30th at the end of that school year. Okay, well, I ask that question every time, so I just wanted to be consistent. That's okay. Anything else? This will be coming back to us uh, for action, I believe, in December. Is That's that correct? correct? Thank you so much. Thank you. And now we will talk about Eames and Esser. The Doug and Tate Show. Thank you, Chairman Porter, members of the board. I'll try to keep you on schedule. Uh, today's slate of schools represents 29 districts with their initial plans and then 23 plans that are change requests. Uh, with the approval today, that'll bring us to 272 of the 286 districts we'll have gone through the process, the task force, the state board, et cetera. Uh, that leaves 14. Uh, as of the other day, we had 11 that had been submitted of those 14. We had three that were in the system and in progress, and I believe we had another one submitted either yesterday afternoon or this morning. So I think we may be down to the last two. Um, just it more of a picture, 243 plans have been uh, approved so far for 279 million. 23 plans uh, represent change requests today. Their total plan will be 20.3 million. The changes represent an additional $3 million on what's already been approved. Uh, and then the, uh, the new plans, 29 of them, $7 million. Um, like I said, our, our numbers have changed a little bit. We were down to three. Uh, that had not been submitted and 11 in the review process. Um, looking at the demographics, a lot of small districts this time, so that's the $7 million for 29 uh, different districts, a lot of, lot of small ones in here. Um, over on the right, most of these plans, or a lot of them, represent their full allocation, and that goes along with um, our cumulative results. Looking at total dollar amounts, um, 279 million approved so far, an additional 7 million today, leaving 57 million still in the pot that hasn't been spent. Um, if we look at the allowable uses, we're still running about 66% for teaching and learning. Um, those traditional categories, still working on how to um, flesh out the premium pay out of the other activities that number 16 blue bar. So we, just as a guess, half of that's probably premium pay, which would go in that teaching and learning, which would bump that percent up. Um, today's new applications, they had 7.8 million at their disposal. Uh, the plans represent 7.4 million. We do have 12,000 in ineligible requests that we'll talk about in just a second. Average expenditures per district, 256,000. That ranges from 51,925, that's Tri-Plains, up to a million and a half, which is El Dorado. And then the uh, per pupil amounts, uh, average is 619, bottoms 279, which is Hodgman County, but that's only 60% of their total allocation, so that'll, that'll jump up. And then the 1543 is for Elk Valley. If we look at the eligible categories again, a lot of districts, 
not a large amount of money when we're talking about millions of dollars, $7 million, but um, I think if that kind of skews our allowable uses a little bit, so um, the teaching and learning is actually a little bit less than 50% in this round. Are there questions concerning ESSER? Ben. Thank you, Mr. Chair. Uh, is this working, Eric? I just got a message saying these are working. Okay, I got some thumbs up. Um, so I have two questions. So the slide that you had earlier about the amount of districts that have submitted their plans. Oh, hi. Um, uh, that didn't add up to 286. Do what? So yeah, there was a slide that had 200, was it 40 districts had submitted plans? 243 have been approved by the approved. task force and the state board. Mm -hmm. And then another 29 today okay. gets us to 272. Okay. There's 286 districts, at least 14. Do the, are the other 14 just not using their allocations or? No, no, no. Okay. They have until this Friday to submit. Okay. 11 of the 14 have submitted. Okay. We are reviewing them currently. There okay. were three still in the system the other day. Um, they were working but had not hit the submit button yet. Okay. And like I said, I think I, we had one more come in yesterday afternoon okay. or this morning. So until Friday. I think we're down to two. Okay. Because I was doing the math. I'm like, wait, we're still missing districts and we're <laughs> wrapping it up. I think and, it all adds up. And the other bit of it is that I've noticed some of them haven't used their full allocation yet. Right. Um, including some before us. What happened? I mean, is there... They, as long as they have submitted an initial mm -hmm. plan to us, then they are good to go. We award okay. the full amount mm -hmm. as soon as we have that plan, but we do not allow them to draw down mm -hmm. anything more than what you all have So approved. they can still change the plan after Friday? Yes. They and add and use the rest of their allocation if they haven't so done? ESSER 2 is good through 2023. So okay, but they can change their plan. So the Friday isn't dropped changes. dead. Provided they've submitted something, they can change it and add to it. Yes. Okay. Thanks for that. With that, Mr. Chair, I move to the Kansas State Board of Education accept the recommendations of the Commissioner's Task Force on ESSER and Ian's distribution of money and approve the submission of public school district expenditure plans for ESSER 2 federal COVID-19 relief funds as presented. Is there a second? Uh, Jim McNeese seconds that motion. Any discussion? All in favor, raise your hand. <laughs> motion carries. And I suppose, Tate, you're going to talk to us about EANS. No, we didn't. We only approved <laughs> ESSER 2. Oh, no, I'm sorry. Uh, okay, thank you. Sorry about that. I'll try. I'm, I'm rushing too fast. I'll take a breath. Welcome, sir. Thank you, Mr. Chair. I'm here to discuss the EANS 2. A uh, couple quick reminders. This is just kind of our standard slide to remind people the differences between EANS and ESSER. EANS is for the private school, but that first one, which we talk about reasonable, necessary, and allocable, is for all of our federal programs. So today we have two things. The first one is just an update. At the last board meeting, you approved the eligible items that we presented pending our plan being approved by the U.S. Department of Education during the last month. That was approved as written. That is important to know because that allowed us to keep the poverty percentage to qualify for EANS 2 at 20 percent. The second piece is what you'll be voting on today. Like I mentioned before, last month you approved the eligible items we brought to you. The task force had asked us to come back this month with further information on a handful of the ineligibles. So we re-looked at 32 items, which you received those in a separate document this month. Of those 32 that were brought back to the task force, 28 of those were deemed eligible by the task force after discussion. So your voting today on EANS 2 is to approve those 28 new eligible items that you received and approve the decision for the remaining ineligible items. And at this point, I'll take any questions. Questions or a motion? Is 
Uh, Dina. I will make a motion. So we, I move that the Kansas State Board of Education accept the recommendations of the Commissioner's Task Force on ESSER and EANS distribution. I guess it's just the EANS distribution of money. The way it's written is right. Is, is it okay. The ESSER and EANS distribution of money and approve the submission of private school expenditure plans for EANS to federal COVID-19 relief funds as presented. Is there a second to that motion? Ben seconds that motion. Any discussion? I'll take a breath this time. In that case, all in favor, please raise your hand. Opposed? Abstain. 901. Thank you, sir. And now we're going to have an update on uh, an overview of ESSER 3. Brad and Doug. So I'm just going to give you a little bit of background, and, and we may have talked about this before, but just to bring it back to the forefront, as we talked about, we're close to um, closing out ESSER 2, and so now we're getting ready to turn our attention as far as the review process goes to, to the ESSER 3s. Um, just a reminder, back in March of 2020, um, that was the first CARES Act, and we got about $80 million, which was 80% of our Title I allocation to be used for pandemic relief. And then in December of 2020, we got ESSER II, which was four times that amount of money. And then in March of 2021, uh, we got ESSER three, or were notified of ESSER three, which was two and a half times the amount of ESSER two. So in total, uh, around $1.2 billion coming in uh, to the state in the last year in, in federal relief funds. In a normal year, our team handles about $250 million in um, federal funding through title and special education. So this is a big, has been a big lift. So our timeline, uh, March 26th, last March 26th, we got our award notice. We got the first two-thirds of the uh, ESSER three allocation at that time. Um, May 23rd, we allocated that to districts. Remember that we had 60 days to get that put out. Um, and so we did that. We met that deadline. Uh, then we had to submit a state plan uh, to get the last third of the funds. And so we did that on June 7th. Uh, after some back and forth with them, uh, we got final approval on July 19th. Um, we got the award notice, actually came before we got official word that our plan had been approved. So we, we knew it was coming. But as part of that approval process, we put a deadline on applications for ESSER three. Um, we set that at September 20th as a reasonable date. The Department of Ed went along with that. Um, and so at the same time, we all also offered uh, districts the opportunity to request an exemption or an extension for that application process so that we could keep it going, and, and the Department of Education was okay with that. Um, so like I said, September 20th was the deadline for that, and then uh, we got a request from the department on the 23rd of September wanting us to provide all of the uh, district websites that have their return to school plans, which is part of getting ESSER three funding that districts all had to agree to and do. Uh, we sent that. We have had inquiries um, on different things, wanting uh, district information so that the Department of Ed and could contact them to start the monitoring process. So we know that's going on out there also. Um, just to kind of give you an idea what our team's been doing since all of this came out, um, if you add all of these up between EANS and the reconsiderations and the ESSERs and the ESSER changes, uh, our team has reviewed about 500 different plans since uh, we started this back in March. 
so we're ready for ESSER 3. Um, just a broad overview, the allowable uses for ESSER 3 do not change. Um, all they've done is, is provide a little bit more detail with each one. ESSER 1 was, uh, had some pretty broad categories. ESSER 2, they started narrowing it down a little, or expanding it on things they had seen ESSER 1 spent on. And then ESSER 3 just fleshes that out a little bit more. But um, you can use any of those different pots of money for the same allowable uses. ESSER 3 does come with a requirement that districts must set aside 20% of their allocation uh, to focus on learning loss, specifically those subgroups that are most impacted or were most impacted by the pandemic. And so that's our EL students, migrant students, homeless students, foster care students, uh, children in poverty, um, racial and ethnic groups, by sex, whoever has been most uh, affected. 20% needs to be geared specifically towards them, and those must be evidence-based practices um, based on the U.S. Department of Ed's definition or Congress's definition of uh, evidence-based practice. There's also a requirement that they must engage their stakeholders in how they are going to be using this money. Um, that's for all of it, but specifically the information that's gathered on... on uh, talking to their stakeholders needs to show, they need to be able to show that they have taken that information and put it into play as far as using that 20%. So stakeholder involvement is very crucial to this. Um, and so districts as part of their application process will be telling us how they went about doing that and then the 20% how they'll be using it. And then Brad is going to talk about the 10% uh, set aside that the state had, uh, which was about $80 million, um, and how we've used it. So thank you, Doug. So just to give you a quick update, because I know you're on a timeline, the 10% set aside from the state, just want to give you a quick update that one of the biggest initiatives was the letter science of reading training that we focused first on our districts that were in counties that were most heavily affected by remote and hybrid. So Johnson, Shawnee, Wyandotte, Sedgwick. So those, the next phase was working with higher ed to get professors trained in the science of reading. And then the third phase is working through our service centers to get out to more rural uh, schools, so that is all going on in place right now. We could not find, as a state, we, our math community, could not find a program such as letters that they liked for math. So we, uh, this board approved, um, I believe it was last month, an opportunity for us to just, we're going to create our own uh, Kansas math, really the, the science of math, and our goal is to have that rolled out next year for our math community. A couple with assessment literacy, just to help our um, school districts better assess where students are. We have our Fast Bridge project and our, our Star Through Renaissance. Again, those aren't ones that we necessarily endorse. Those are just the ones that are most widely used by school districts in the state, so we wanted to get the biggest bang, so we're just trying to get them additional trainings uh, on assessment literacy. Our continued work with Kansans Can Competency, that's that wheel, the inter, intra, personal, cognitive skills with Patty and Amy out of KU. They're doing a lot more to put resources out and trainings across the state. Uh, you had higher paths here last week, uh, or excuse me, last month to share. They've got some really good videos, so I just want to keep reminding people that as they continue their work. And then the Kansas Teaching and Leading Project, that's the website that we were able to work with our service centers, create where we house a lot of the modules, uh, online trainings that uh, teachers can get access to anytime, anywhere. So. With that, just want to give you a, uh, just a brief update on some of the work we're doing with our ESSER funds. Thank you very much. Are there any questions? Ann. 
Thank you, Mr. Chair. Um, one for each of you. Doug, was the stakeholder requirement only for S or three? Was there anything for S or two? Okay. Uh, it's specifically called out. It's specifically called out in S or three. So as they make requests for S or three, they have to describe how they got teachers and all that involved, parents? How they engaged all those different groups, okay. teachers, parents, uh, civil rights organizations, all, they're called out. Gotcha. And, and Brad, thank you very much, Doug. Uh, what is the math thing we're working on? I know letters, uh, you know, structured literacy was a process for teaching reading. Are we trying to develop a process for teaching reading? It's, it's, or I mean math? It's, it's not just a process, it's how, especially if you're uh, just teaching good core math uh -huh. to all students, what happens when you have students that aren't, that, that are struggling with your, your curriculum and how you're, so it's more that tiered. It's like structured literacy, it's the uh -huh. science. How do we get down to that level two and level three? Letters has a really good program that we've been using, mm -hmm. so we're just working with them. But our math people couldn't find one that they were willing to invest in for math. So we're cooperating or working with a couple national experts that have been working with our MTSS schools to develop our own in Kansas. Okay. I'm just wondering if there is nothing that's agreed to and have, I mean, and the schools haven't asked for it, will they use it once we have it? Well, there's a lot of requests for it. We just want to make sure it's of quality that we would believe in. So the okay. nice thing with this is when it's done, then we own it. Okay. And it'll be aligned to our standards and we will be able to make adjustments where letters is not ours. Some more like tiered support for kids with math issues. Right. Yes. Thank you. Appreciate it. We'll continue this discussion later, but right now, uh, we are going we're we're going to be in recess, but that doesn't give you any time off. Uh, uh, because at, we're going to reconvene exactly at eleven twenty five for the purpose of hearing oral arguments. So we'll take a break until 1125, and then we will promptly start the oral argument.
Please, please take your seats. We're going to start in about a minute and a half. This time I will convene the hearing of the State Board of Education, convene the hearing under Kansas Administrative Procedures Act for case number 21, PPC 01. Uh, Jennifer Holt, who is the chair of the PPC, is uh, on Zoom and is uh, available to answer any questions that uh, the board may have of her. need to point out to... Uh, all involved that we have had uh, the, the, the board has had access to all uh, exhibits uh, and uh, the video of the hearing uh, knowing my colleagues as I do I assume all of us have become extremely familiar with what we've been given uh, and so uh, we will uh, proceed uh, with that uh, in case. Does anybody, before we start, does anybody have questions for Jennifer? Seeing none, then we will start the process. Uh, each uh, party will have 15 minutes and it will be a hard 15 minutes. Uh, Mr. Gordon, you, I believe you will start. Thank you, Chairman Porter, if I, if I may. Of my 15 minutes, I'd like to reserve five for rebuttal. That if, I'd like to reserve five of minutes of my time for rebuttal. Don't, don't start the time yet. I needed to say this. I am not an attorney. I don't know how to do all this stuff. So if an objection happens, I will always refer to Mr. To, to Mr. Ferguson, who will advise me, and I'll decide whether or not to pay attention. <laughs> uh, thank you, Mr. Chairman. May it please the board, my name is Scott Gordon. I am speaking on behalf of the Kansas State Department of Education. As all of you are aware, you have the materials for you in the matter of the licensure of the licensee. Now, out of respect for her privacy, I'm not going to use her name during the hearing. If I say licensee, I'm pretty sure you know who it is I'm talking about. Um, I'm not going to belabor any of the facts and, and repeat all of them that you've already read about. What I did want to provide for you was a summary of the timeline of events of how the licensee wound up with a felony DUI. Now what makes the driving under the influence a crime of a felony in the state of Kansas? Well, if you have two prior convictions or if you have a diversion and a conviction, your third arrest may be punishable as a felony, which is exactly what happened for the licensee. She has been licensed as a teacher from the State Board of Education since 1998. While she was licensed as a teacher, as recently as four years ago, she was arrested for the first time for DUI. She was actually under diversion at the time that she was arrested for the second time, about a year and a half later for driving under the influence of alcohol. And while they were in the process of revoking that diversion because of the second arrest, she gets arrested a third time for driving under the influence of alcohol. She finally gets convicted for the first two, which by the time she is convicted in January of 2021, that results in the conviction of a felony DUI. 
Uh, I show this to you because there's not very many felonies that I can think of that requires a pattern of conduct before that conduct actually becomes a felony. First two, first two DUIs, those are misdemeanors. You all as the state board, you never look at those, you never consider them. It's not until you do essentially a bad thing, and I think we can all agree that a DUI is a bad thing, that it becomes a felony. One of the reasons why we're here is uh, the Professional Practice Commission conducted a hearing. They received all the evidence. Uh, they deliberated for a significant amount of time, and they came to the conclusion that there was, in fact, professional misconduct, and that some level of discipline was warranted. The Professional Practices Commission, however, felt uh, for their reasons that revocation was not appropriate, that they wanted to just issue a, or recommend a suspension until July of next year. Keep in mind that just like any other advisory body that you have, you have the right and the ability to not necessarily agree with that body. And the Professional Practices Commission is an advisory body, just like your accreditation, uh, your, your ARCs, um, your standards board. They come up with recommendations that you don't necessarily follow every single time. You don't necessarily follow the recommendations of the Professional Practices Commission every time. And in this case, it's the position of the State Department of Education that you should not follow the recommendations of the Professional Practices Commission. And here's why. I want to share with you just the language of the law. And here's the difference. We've talked about this several times. Suspension is of a license which is for a definite period of time. A suspended license shall be reinstated at the end of the suspension period. So you only hear from the licensee one time. And no matter what, unless and until there's another complaint alleging professional misconduct, you don't know how that person has performed during that term of suspension. You don't know if they've, been, if they've successfully been rehabilitated during that term of suspension. You, would, you don't have any more ability to, to hear how that teacher is doing or how that licensee is doing, pardon me. There is not an allowance, at least the way that this has been interpreted for the past decade, to put conditions on a suspension. Meaning you can't say, well, you are suspended for one year, so long as you come back, you show proof that you successfully completed probation. It's for a finite period of time, right? This is the type of uh, penalty or result that would be imposed on somebody for breaching a teaching license. That's just one example that's most commonly used for suspension. Revocation. Now, the first part of this seems like it's, it's the, you know, the, the nail in the coffin, right? But it's not. Your regulation says that revocation of a license shall be permanent except, and it's the exceptions that I think are extremely important. Any person who has had a license revoked, now if they've had a license revoked, they may apply for a new license, and they can submit evidence of rehabilitation to the Kansas Professional Practices Commission. And it's the position of the Department of Education that that is the appropriate remedy in this particular case. That suspension is not appropriate. You want to know how she's done since she's been convicted. And the only way for you to know that is if you revoke the license. Now it turns out she may be a fantastic teacher. And maybe five years from now, the district or some district absolutely wants her back in the classroom. That's great. Show evidence of that and that five years or more have passed and there's probably a pretty good chance she gets a license back. But at the very least, you've done you, your due diligence to make sure that that rehabilitation has actually occurred. Now, it is absolutely true that this assumes that someone has had a license revoked. You don't have to revoke the licensee's license. You absolutely have that discretion. You could do nothing if you wanted to. But I know that there may be concerns about what kind of precedent might you be setting if you disagree with the Professional Practices Commission. And I will tell you, it's the position of the department, you're not setting any kind of a precedent. You're continuing the precedent that has been a part of the, the orders of the, the Board of Education since at least 2001. I gotta share a side note with you. 
I actually challenged my staff. I said, find me another case that we have any records of where the State Board of Education has allowed someone to keep their teaching license within five years of the date of conviction. I was going to offer them whatever, buy whatever candy bar they wanted if they could find it. Because I was not aware of any. I beat them because I found it. One time in 2001, the State Board of Education allowed someone to keep their teaching license even though they had been convicted within the past five years. Here's the difference on that particular case. That was in 2001. A statute that prohibits you from issuing a new license or a renewed license within five years of conviction did not add felony DUIs until 2008. So I can say with a fair amount of certainty, except for that one time, to the best of my knowledge, we've looked at all of our records, the state board has never allowed someone to keep their teaching license within five years from the date of conviction. And a large part of this is because of 72-2165. This is a law that's been in place for decades, but as of 2008, a felony DUI was included in this idea of a felony. Now, I've abbreviated a lot of the statute because it goes on and on and on, and, and you don't care. Thank you. This says the State Board of Education may issue or renew a license of a person convicted if the State Board determines that the person has been rehabilitated for a period of at least five years from the date of conviction. And the question that I pose to this body, and it was a, it's a question I posed to the Professional Practices Commission as well, but they didn't really answer it. When you traditionally hold licensed teachers to a higher standard than you hold to someone for their conduct before they were licensed, why in this particular case would you change and go against your own precedent and allow someone to keep a license when if she were applying for a new license today, she would not be eligible. You've never, you have not done that in the past. The Department of Education does not believe that it's appropriate. And I think that you'll find in your deliberations, uh, you don't believe it's appropriate either. If that's the, the finding that we hope you make. And as a reminder, she was convicted as of the date of sentencing, January of 2021. So it's certainly been in less than five years. So the request from the Department of Education is that you order revocation of the licensee's license, um, effective immediately. If there's any questions, I'm happy to answer them now, or I can, if there are questions for me, I'll wait until I speak the second time. Uh, we will hold questions until the end, because if there may be questions to both. Okay, at this time, Hi, hello. My name is, as was mentioned, is Kimberly Strite Vogelsberg, and I am the attorney representing the licensee who is also here today. Um, can you hear me? All right. Okay. Um, her license is before you, as Mr. Gordon stated, because she entered a guilty plea to the charge of a felony DUI. So I presume that you have read the many materials submitted to you by the PPC, myself, and Mr. Gordon. And I'm here today to answer your questions and also to explain to you that the PPC's decision in our uh, vantage point was not only in accordance with Kansas law, but was well-reasoned and fair and a rational decision that should be upheld by you all. So let me first address the issue of the law and what discretion you all have. The PPC conducted a hearing to consider the facts and made a recommendation to spend her license until July of next, or of this summer, next summer. That recommendation does not violate Kansas law. As Mr. Gordon said, for serious um, felonies, uh, there is a prohibition from issuing or renewing a license for a period of five years after that crime has occurred. Um, for less serious, or for, for any, amount of time. For less serious crimes, such as a felony DUI, it prevents it for that five-year period. But for, for other crimes, felonies, 
where there is not a license being issued or renewed, the PPC has the discretion to consider what discipline it, it thinks is best, and you all have the ability to do that as well. So because we do not have a license being issued or renewed, there is no requirement that you revoke that license. There is no requirement that the PPC recommend to revoke that license. Um, so that's why we're here today, because this action doesn't stem from a new application or a license or a renewal of a license. The PPC considered the facts and utilized the discretion that it had under the law and recommended a suspension. The PPC did not violate Kansas law. And if you all would like to, I, I submit, if you would like to um, follow a bright line rule, if you believe there should be a practice of doing that, you all are very familiar with the um, procedure for how to promulgate other rules or to change the laws and get that law changed. But under existing law, the PPC and you guys have the discretion to consider all discipline. So looking at the facts under that legal discretion, I believe that the PPC did make the correct decision in this case. So not only was it legally permissible, but it was fair and reasonable, and uh, it is a, would be a perfectly reasonable decision for you all to adopt that initial determination as your final order. So under, under Kansas law, and I know you all are very familiar with this, um, it's, it's evident that the Kansas legislature representing the Kansas people agreed that a PPC, the Professional Practice Commission of Peers, was a necessary voice in this process. By law, we know that the PPC consists of nine members and they are from various levels of school in various educational roles. Um, they include teachers, principals, a superintendent, the Kansas statute requires that they have five years of experience. They have to have that at least three years prior to their appointment, be certified, actively practicing. So it's clear by Kansas law that we in Kansas value the experience and the opinion of our teachers, of our people in the profession, and we want to continue to um, listen to those voices. So in addition to having the experience necessary to judge and police their own profession, the PPC members were also the ones to conduct the hearing that is required under the regulations. They are the ones who could evaluate um, the licensee's credibility, could evaluate the strength of the state's evidence and the rehabilitation efforts. So um, this practice is recognized under Kansas law when it requires the board to give due regard to fact finders opportunity to determine the credibility of the witnesses. So we look to those people who heard the witnesses, who were there and firsthand experienced these things to judge that credibility. And here, that was the PPC. So um, I know that you have all had a chance to review that record, and I hope that you have, because I think you will find that um, by listening to Ms. Gossage's story, um, I hope that you would reach the same conclusion that the PPC did. The PPC heard that um, the licensee had been teaching for approximately 20 years. In 2014, she began teaching high school science at Wichita West, and education is a passion in her life. But just like anyone from any profession, um, other things happen in your life that sometimes get in the way of that, and her life, as anyone's is, is not easy. So following some financial, marital, family crisis issues, um, alcohol was looked to as a way to relieve that stress. Um, for the first time in her life, she tried that option. And when she found that she drank, she could not quit drinking. So there was no one or two drinks with dinner or friends. What would happen is that she would end up drinking heavily. And then while under the influence of that much alcohol, um, good decisions were not made. She was incapable of making those good decisions, and that resulted in the DUIs that you've all heard about. So until she realized that her drinking habits were a form of alcoholism that required treatment, she was unsuccessful in her efforts to quit on her own. She needed help. Before she got to that point, though, she had this felony DUI, and that was on February 23rd of 2019. 
and she admits that her son was in the vehicle with her during that felony DUI, but she also admits that that should have never happened, it's never acceptable, and that she is responsible for that. This was a devastating event to her, and she finally sought help outside. She got help and realized that she did have alcoholism, and she did um, need treatment. She uh, quit drinking and attended the first of hundreds of AA, Alcoholics Anonymous, meetings. Um, in addition, with her court-ordered monitoring for her house arrest, she voluntarily installed additional safety measures to keep her accountable, and she sought counseling for her personal issues to help manage her stress, and focused on finding a supportive community around her to give her an opportunity to succeed in her sobriety. She remained committed to teaching, and she told the PPC that she wants nothing more than to be able to continue her passion and um, to continue her career of teaching. So the PPC heard that story and apparently found it credible. They found that Miss Gossage admitted to the fact that her son was there and she took responsibility for that. She expressed recognition of and remorse for her actions. And the PPC found that Miss Gossage demonstrated a fitness to retain her teaching license. They found a revocation was not warranted. They found that she could suitably be placed in a position of trust and to ensure that that could occur to ensure that she would be in a position of trust and to be the, a suitable role model. They decided that a one year suspension was enough time for her to demonstrate her continued sobriety and her continued efforts at rehabilitation. So they looked at these two options, uh, revocation or something less than, they considered the facts before them and they used their discretion and their experience to come to the conclusion that this one year suspension was um, the best option for everyone involved. If additional events occurred, if there was a problem with her sobriety or additional criminal activity, um, an additional complaint against her license could be made and we would end up right back where we are now. So we believe that the PPC's consideration of evidence is thorough, it's accurate, their legal conclusions were well balanced, they were reasonable conclusions, their initial order is within the discretion legally given to them by Kansas law. So. I know that there is um, statutes that set out the review that this board has, and I've been in my position long enough and monitored you all long enough to know that you take that duty of review seriously, and I applaud you for those efforts. However, I submit to you that in this particular instance, in these particular facts, there is no legal reason to overturn the PPC's initial order. Um, like so many other times before you, the PPC considered the facts on an individual basis and made a decision um, after careful consideration of a lengthy hearing. Um, and I believe if you watch that recording and listen to that hearing, that you will all make the same um, conclusion as the PPC did. So for those reasons, I request that this board adopt the PPC's initial order as its final order. And I'm happy to answer any questions. I'm not sure which order you'd like to have that occur in. I'd prefer for us to completely complete the presentations and then I'll open it up for questions. Thank you. Mr. Gordon, you have time for a rebuttal. Did you say I had five minutes and six seconds? Thank you. I'll use every one of them. Uh, there's no allegation or any reason to think that the Professional Practice Commission did not do their job. They absolutely did. But keep in mind that the Professional Practices Commission did express some concerns of their own that I think that you share as well. The Professional Practices Commission did question um, how straightforward she had been with her employer, which the Wichita School District at the time of her arrest and the time of her conviction. The Professional Practices were concerned that she still needed to wear an ankle bracelet to ensure her own sobriety. And the Professional Practices Commission were certainly concerned enough to say this warrants some level of discipline. So this was not a clean slate, we absolutely love this person, put her back in the classroom today. That's not the recommendation you received from the PPC. And I ask you to consider this. If a teacher were to walk away from the classroom today 
and being breach of contract, leaving that the school high and dry, but if essentially only injuring that school district, the remedy from this board would be to suspend through June of 2022. Do you think that is the that same remedy is appropriate for someone who, in the middle of the night, on one of the busiest highways in the middle of Wichita, Kansas, was driving her vehicle in a manner that caused the, everyone else around her to slow down, to make sure she didn't hit everybody, that caused people on that highway to call police multiple times to let them know that there was a drunk driver on the highway, putting not only herself and everyone else in that, in, on that highway at the time in danger, but also her own 14-year-old child. The Department of Education does not believe that those are equal offenses, and the department does not believe that the remedy or the punishment for those two offenses should be the same either. And that is why we believe revocation is most appropriate. At the end of the day, certainly the Professional Practice Commission did their job. They made the findings a fact. They did make some determinations. But I would suggest you have all of that information in front of you. You have the opportunity to review those hearings yourself. Later on, as you deliberate, I encourage you to watch the videos of the testimony, watch the videos of the arrest. Because at the end of the day, it's the Kansas State Board of Education that has their name and their title on the door. So ultimately, the, de the decision does rest on your shoulders. That's why I do have to bring it to your attention and ask that you follow your own precedent and find that there's nothing unique about this particular case that would warrant you to not hold someone at least as accountable as you would hold somebody that would be applying for the license for the first time. Respectfully, the department asks that you revoke the license. Thank you, minor point, but I believe as I listen to the, uh, to the uh, testimony that uh, minor son was 16 at the time, was that? Yes. 16 at the time. I apologize if I had the age incorrect. Yeah, it was, well, I, it, it's sure. still minor. I, would just, I mean, yeah. it's still a minor child. But I, I don't know why I had 14 stuck in my mind. Okay, well, I just wanted to. That, Thanks, sir. I just wanted you to know that I actually heard, read, read the stuff. So, do you want to? You have to, five minutes left. I have some questions, then I'll open it to the others. What day, can somebody tell me what day of the week, July the 24th and February the 23rd are? July the 24th, 2017, and February the 23rd, 2019. February 23rd. Sorry, what, year, what were the years again? 2017 and 2019. And what was the first date? July the 24th. According to my phone, July 24th, 2017 was a Monday. And February the 23rd, 2019? 2019, February 23rd, according to my phone, was a Saturday. Okay, are those the correct dates? Thank you. Uh, this would be a question to you. Uh, I was concerned that uh, that there were no letters of support from supervisors. What conclusions should we draw from that? I think the, the reason that there were no letters, and I don't want to um, introduce new evidence, but my understanding in working with the client is that there was a change in administration and it's a big district, and to go and get the recommendation of someone that you've never met for a proceeding like this was... It just didn't didn't happen, um, but the district um, does still employ her, and I don't believe there's any um, negative issues surrounding this issue um, with her employer. And this is a question to both of you. Does this, in your opinion, does this board have options other than approving the recommendation of the PPC? or revocation, 
are there intervening things that we have the option, have the authority to consider? The only thing that you are bound to is the discipline. You can take no action. You can publicly, you can censure. You can suspend. You can revoke. Those are the four things that this body can do. And you can suspend for a longer period of time. You can suspend for a shorter period of time. Uh, I, th I believe that you have full discretion to do any of those things. Okay, so based on your interpretation, uh, we could do anything in between those two or nothing or actually. I believe that's accurate. Issue a license tomorrow. Well, she, she has a current license. I mean, this wasn't, there is an issue with that in three years, but she has a license as of today. Okay. Any, anything relating to that? No, as I'm sure your um, own um, attorney has informed you, there's a Kansas statute that um, defines what the review process is and what your final order upon review has to include. That's KSA 77527. Um, and I would just ask that you comply with that statute. I understand that the law says that we, we have to revoke if something happens within five years. If this license is needs to be renewed during that five-year period, are we obligated not to renew it at that time? Okay. To clarify, I don't believe that there's anything in the law that requires you to revoke today. You don't have to take action today. I mean, I'm talking about when it comes to doing five years. Now, when it comes, if there was, the position from the department is, if a license is set to expire, or rather she applies to renew within that five years from conviction, she would not be eligible to receive that license. Okay. Because okay. of that statute that I cited. Okay. I think that may be a point of contention in when and when if and when that comes up, but I'm just telling you what the position of the department is. The ankle bracelet that detects alcohol, who is the audience for that? What's the purpose? Is that? I can, I can summarize, I think, I, for what it's worth, we want to be careful in not introducing a whole lot of new evidence that was not already given to you. That's fine. We don't want to get into a situation of cross-examining. I don't think that's your intention. If I may summarize what was stated, and I think Jen, she's on the line, she may recall this as well. That was a personal choice made by the licensee to ensure, to help ensure her own sobriety, but it was not court ordered. Yeah, that's a, my understanding too, but I was wondering who the audience is, you know, is that? To yes, there, there were two bracelets. One of them was the location bracelet for her house arrest that's court ordered. The other is the alcohol monitoring one. That's the one that she did voluntarily. So the audience would be the company that provides that herself. It was for her own attorneys, her own sobriety and rehabilitation efforts okay. and her criminal cases. And uh, please stay. Uh, I only have one more, and it's not a question, it's a statement, that, and, and I'll give you an opportunity to respond. Whenever I was listening to the hearing, I was concerned with the fact that the answer to the question, uh, should teachers be held to a higher standard, was not answered. Can you elaborate on that? That was a concern to me. Yes, I understand the importance of that question. Um, my understanding of that, having sat through that same hearing, was that her ultimate answer was that she didn't understand what was being asked of her. I think she was hesitant to confirm something that she thought was something she didn't understand and would be used against her. Um, I believe that if you ask her that question today, she would, would give you an answer um, that you would be happy with. But of course, that hearing is concluded. We have that option. Yes. Uh, Anne. Um, Thank you. Thank you, Mr. Chair. I had a, a question, ma'am, for you. Um, that I wasn't clear to me. Did Do you know why the um, commission chose July of next year? Did they have a discussion about, I mean, was it related to the rehabilitation or? Because as I understand it, she has been rehabilitated now for almost three years. 
Is that right? I think it was related to the date of the hearing, but I'm Jen is on this uh, or here with us, and I'm sure she would love to explain the PPC's decision for yes, you. Yes, let's have Jennifer. You want to answer that question? Sure. If I remember correctly, it was that there was there was openness in the language on whether it was from the date of conviction or the date of the incident. And so that mm -hmm. hit the five year mark gotcha. from the date of the incident mm -hmm. is where I think that all came together for us. By incident, you mean the first arrest? Because the last one was 2019. It must have been the first one then. Okay. Like that's, we were trying to, we weren't clear on, do we have like, do we have to do it based on the incident or based on the final when that, so that five year window was fuzzy. And so that's where I think it came from. Thank you. Thank you, Mr. Chair. Jean. Is this, okay. I just wanted to clarify exactly what our options are. Um, going forward as a board, it, it's my understanding that we could take no action and that that would keep in place the PPC um, decision. Is that correct? No, you still have to vote one way or the other. Okay. If you take no action, that means we're here next month asking for you to vote on it again. Uh, okay. Then um, in addition to that, we could take action to approve the CC PPC recommendation. Is that correct? You could do that. Okay. We could issue a censure, which is a statement against this type of behavior. You could do that. Okay. We could suspend um, for a different period of time than the PPC recommended. Is that correct? You could do that. Or, or we could um, revoke. Is that okay? That is correct. All right. Well, I just wanted to make sure we understood what our options would be going forward. Thank you. I think for what it's worth, and I'm sure Mark will advise you this as well, to be very clear, whatever action you take, you will have to make specific findings and basically give an explanation as to why you took whatever that action is. Um, but you certainly have the authority as the board to do any of those things. Mr. Ferguson regularly makes that clear, very clear to us. Thank you. I thought it was only fair to, that I say the same thing. I'm sure he will. Melanie. Thank you, Mr. Chair. Does this work? Um, forgive the potential redundancy. I, I did watch all of the video, review the documents, and I want to make sure that this is fully documented for everyone who's watching as well as understanding of the board. I have two questions. Um, the licensee currently has a license. Is she currently teaching? Um, with the understanding that if you all acted on this decision to today or last month or at some point, we expected that the suspension would go into effect if approved during the school year. So rather than start in a licensed position and have to move out of that, uh, she worked with the district to uh, do the whole year as a paraprofessional so that she wouldn't have to switch or leave them in a bind. But she's employed with them, um, maintains her license, until these proceedings tell her otherwise, but is working in it as a para right now. Thank you. And I think my next question is for Mr. Gordon. If we allow her to keep her license conditionally or, uh, well, if we allow her to keep her license conditionally and she gets another DUI in a month, then what happens? Are you notified? Are we notified? Then I file another complaint. Um, I mean, if you allow her to keep her license, and I want to be very clear, there's no such thing as keeping a license conditionally. You either have a license or you don't. Um, uh, yeah, even if she were suspended between now and whenever and she receives another DUI, uh, then most likely the agency would file a complaint uh, asking for you to, again, revoke her license um, based on that. Thank you. Oh, 
my question is for the uh, licensee's uh, attorney. If someone cannot receive a license without, uh, within five years after having received a felony DUI, what makes the, this person different? In other words, because she's a, she has a license, why should we look at her any differently? I think the answer to that is I find in the law. The law requires that someone in her position is entitled to a hearing and a decision based on the facts and her circumstances with an outcome based on the discretion of the PPC and this board for those four options that we've been discussing. So that's what the law in Kansas entitles her to is an individual decision based on her unique set of facts. So if if you disagree with that law, that's where um, I can understand some of your questions or frustrations, but we have to operate on the law as it currently is, which requires that we consider the facts and circumstances of her case. And that's what I'm asking you all to do. So you're asking us to look at the personal issues rather than the uh, legal facts? Well, I'm asking you to keep in mind that the law does not require you to revoke. It requires you to conduct a hearing and to consider the facts and make a decision based on the evidence in front of you, as opposed to imposing a bright line rule or um, you know, having something happen automatically as, a, as an operation of law. So, that would be my position is that we follow the law and make a decision based on the evidence and facts before us as opposed to imposing a rule that is um, not found in law. Thank you. I'm sorry and if that then, was confusing. <laughs> and then that brings another question to mind if I can ask it, Mr. Chairman. And so, if a person has the same issue and applies for a license within those five years of conviction, do they have any means by which to challenge or to come and, sit and do much the same as the teacher has done? Or do you have to have a license, hold a license to have the hearing? Uh, if I understand your question correctly, you're asking if someone applies for a license today for the first time after having been convicted of a felony within the last five years, what do we do about that? We do the same exact thing. The department would file a complaint asking for denial of that license based on the state statute being very clear that person's not eligible for, the process would be exactly the same. We treat applicants and licensees uh, exactly the same as far as procedure. I guess my question is, would, if that person disagreed mm -hmm. with the finding, would they be able to challenge it as well? and say um, there are extenuating facts that I think you should know. They could try. They wouldn't win, but they could try. I would take that case, I'll take that case all day long. Well, I'm the, just Right, the, the statute, I think the statute's very clear. It's not even discretionary. This could be the teacher of the year applying to renew his or her license, and it doesn't matter. If there's a, been a felony conviction, there, you cannot issue or renew a license unless you find there's been at least five years of rehabilitation from the date of conviction 
or from the date of the offense, which the statute's not written very well, but. Um, so yeah. if this teacher had been simply renewing their license, mm -hmm. we would be talking about something different. No, you'd be talking about in the, the finding sorry. because of what the statute says. Is that correct? No, you'd be talking about the same exact thing, and I think it's a much shorter conversation. I hold up the date of conviction. I hold up the statute, and my case is done. That's kind of what I'm saying. If right. she was renewing mm -hmm. a license, mm -hmm. we would have a statute telling us how we needed to respond. That is correct. Okay. Yes. Thank you. I couldn't hear. Did you call on me, Taryn Porter? I'm having challenges hearing. Hopefully you can hear me okay. Um, my question is, is on the sanctions that are not applied to a misdemeanor, uh, are there sanctions applied to misdemeanor DUIs? No. Okay. Misdemeanor DUIs, we don't, I don't wanna say we don't look at them, but you all have never taken action, and unless there is, let me back up, unless there is a child involved, or it's a DUI of drugs, which is extremely rare, but generally speaking, a misdemeanor DUI um, is not something that this board takes action against. Okay, so it's the third time that's that's a charm. Uh, the, the other question, if alcoholism is um, considered mental illness or put in that category, um, is that ever factored into what we as a board would look at? I'm not aware of any case that I've pursued in the past near decade where alcoholism was an, uh, not an excuse or a mitigating factor, it was just an explanation behind certain behavior. Um, I think that's probably a point of deliberation for the board to consider if that's, yeah, I, sorry, I don't know that I've got a good answer for that. Okay, thank you. Sure, um, I'm not sure that there's a controlling um, way in the law, there's not a specific answer addressing how you have to treat alcoholism, but as Mr. Gordon said, it would be um, considered as an explanation, as perhaps a mitigating factor, considered how they treat and re rehabilitate those circumstances, it's certainly part of the facts that uh, we would ask you all to consider and are asking you to consider in this case. Now is this on? Thank you very much. The board will be making the decisions later. We will be deliberating later this afternoon. I anticipate, but cannot guarantee, that we'll have a decision. Uh, but I anticipate that we will have a decision this afternoon at the time on the agenda that it is that it is scheduled. For that. Thank you uh, for your presentation. And uh, we are now in recess until 1.30.
call the afternoon session back into order. I am pleased to welcome Miss Kansas. We are in the presence of royalty to the podium. During her year of service as the reigning Miss Kansas, Taylor is bringing awareness to public about uh, the positive impact of music. Uh, she is an accomplished percussionist and is majoring in music education. And as a very, very old music educator, uh, we certainly welcome you to the State Board of Education and are certainly looking forward to your presentation. And I don't understand why, but uh, it's been requested that we have a picture uh, with Taylor after this is over. So be prepared, be on your best behavior, ladies and gentlemen. Welcome. We are looking forward to hearing you. band, choir, and orchestra. As a percussionist, I hope to teach my own high school band and have a great big marching band one day somewhere in Kansas and eventually get my master's in school administration and hopefully be a principal or superintendent probably about 30 years down the line though. But that's kind of the plan right now for me. But right now I have this wonderful opportunity to serve our state as Miss Kansas. And every year Miss Kansas does about four to 500 different events per year. So at least one a day. If you had the news on this morning, you might've seen me on Fox 43 or you might've been in session already, but you can probably watch it after. And then tomorrow I'm doing some school visits and later in the week I will be going to Indiana where I will speak at the Percussive Arts Society International Convention. So getting to speak to hundreds of percussionists from across the world, and I'm very, very excited to go there. But I'm here with you all today and very glad to be here. So I want to tell you how I got started in the Miss Kansas organization. It is a three-part program that serves men and women ranging in age from age 5 to 26. So the first part of our program is the Sunflower Mentoring Program. And I started in the Sunflower Mentoring Program when I was five years old as a sunflower. And that is for boys and girls ages five to 12. And you learn about serving in your community, growing in your confidence, and all about the Miss America organization and the scholarships that you can earn from that one day. I think we might. Do I just need to click through, anyone? It was working, oh, there we go. Just took a couple of seconds. So that's me at age five when I started in the program. And I learned very, very many things that year from our current Miss Kansas at the time. Her name was Megan Bushel. She's in the picture with me. And what really caught my attention was the candidate who I was mentoring with played piano. And I played piano. And that hooked me in from the get-go. And watching her go on to win the talent award that night at Miss Kansas was so inspiring. And I thought, I can do that too one day. And then at the end of the week, although my candidate wasn't crowned the overall winner, I got to see a young woman go on to be Miss Kansas 2006. And right then at age five, I had a goal for myself to one day be Miss Kansas. So I'm a very stubborn individual. You can ask my mom. You might know Natalie Clark. That's my mom. You can say, you know, Taylor's pretty stubborn and she's going to stick with it and work hard towards that goal. And I've been working towards this goal since that day in the photo. And I continued on to our second stage of the program, which is the Outstanding Teen Competition. And this is for young women ages 13 to 18. So they're at that perfect age, getting ready for post-secondary. They're earning scholarships to go towards their education and learning more about personal and professional development development to really hone in those skills for their future career or service ambitions. And so at age 13, I wrote my first resume and I learned a lot about working with people in the community, asking for sponsorships, gaining donations to help me go on to the state competition, things like that. And also earning scholarships along the way. So my very first year at age 13, I was pretty shy. I don't think I wore any makeup. Mom did my hair and I played the piano for my talent which at the time was a bit of a shock to some people because I also play the drums. But I learned so very much that year from Stevie Mack, who is the current Miss Kansas Outstanding Teen. And she had a goal for herself, which was to be a Radio City Rockette. And she's 
a girl from Kansas, and she thought, you know, this is a lofty goal, but I'm going to work hard and go towards that and run after it with all of my ability. And I'm proud to say that this year, she has started her season as a Radio City Rocket. After six years of auditioning, she's met that goal. So seeing her determination and her drive really encouraged me to continue on in the teen program. And I came back again in 2014, and that time I'd learned more things. I was more confident. I stood up straighter. I talked louder, and I played the drums this time. And that next year, I thought, I want to come back again and win the talent award this time. I want to go back to that goal. So in 2015, I came back, and I played the drums again, played a song called Cute. It was pretty cute. And I won the talent award for it. And I thought, all right, let's win the whole dang thing this time. So in 2016, it was my fourth year competing. I really thought I was hot stuff. I served hours and hours in my community. I worked hard on my social impact. I'd been working out, practicing my talent, locking myself in the band room until midnight or later to just really beef it up. And I got fifth place. And I decided, well, maybe this isn't for me. Maybe this isn't the dream that I was supposed to have. So I took a step back from the Outstanding Teen program. But then I got a call about this time in the year. It was late October, and it was a gentleman who had mentored girls in my position before. And he said, hey, I want you to come and be a teen contestant for me. And just see. Just be yourself. Have fun with it, and we'll see how it goes. It's your last year. Why not? And in 2017, I'm happy to say I won the Talent Award. I won the Fitness Award shocked me to death. I'm not very coordinated. You have to do a push-up and a little routine on stage. But ultimately, I won the title of Miss Kansas Outstanding Teen 2017, and I got to travel and serve our state, speaking to schools, serving with Children's Miracle Network hospitals, being a state goodwill ambassador for them, raising money for them, and championing our Kansas kids. And I also got to go on to Miss America's Outstanding Teen, where I won two talent awards, the non-finalist talent award and the outstanding instrumentalist award. So I'm our most decorated teen title holder from Kansas. And the program's 16-year history, I'm very proud of that. And hopefully, we'll have some more hardware come home from Miss America very soon. So I decided after my time in the teen program, after earning $4,500 in cash scholarships and using in-kind scholarships to kickstart my education with online classes, I was ready to go to K-State, where I am now. And I really, really loved my time at K-State and taking a year off this year. But I got rolling and was spending my scholarships. And I said, oh, no. <laughs> It's time to earn some more. I have to finish my degree. So in 2019, I competed for my first local title of Miss Augusta. And even though there was a tornado and a power outage, somehow the competition went on. And I won that local title. And I went on to Miss Kansas after that, after a brief two-year stint of the COVID-19 pandemic, which we are still in today, as you all know. And we had Miss Kansas last July. So on July 10th, I was crowned Miss Kansas on my very first try. Um, I earned quite a few scholarship dollars through this opportunity, but we'll talk about that in just a second. And I'm our first Miss Kansas who was ever Miss Kansas Outstanding Teen and the first to be a drummer. And very soon, in about a month, I will travel to Connecticut where I will compete for the title of Miss America to hopefully make Kansas proud and bring home the title, in addition to winning more scholarship dollars towards finishing my degree at K-State and my master's program. But I want to tell you what all goes into competing, because it's much more than looks. We no longer have the swimsuit competition. We are in the era of Miss America 2.0. So preparing the world for great women is what we're doing, and great women for the world. We are honing in our personal and professional development skills by serving in our communities, making connections at the corporate level, at the business level, state, national, international level. So for me personally, my social impact initiative is called Sound for Common Ground Music Connects. And before going to Miss Kansas, I served for 1,200 hours in my community, working hard to bring music to our Kansas communities and schools. And I was recognized for that at the state level as one of the top five finalists for the Social Impact Division, formerly called the Platform. So music is the cause that I champion throughout my year, and I want to share with everyone that I meet in Kansas, and hopefully the nation. 
There is also the social impact pitch, which is kind of like a brief elevator pitch that you give on your social impact. Mm -hmm. Give some stats, figures. So personally, already I've already spoken to over 50,000 50, people this year, just since July. And I definitely plan to share that at Miss America, as well as share some exciting new partnerships that are coming down the pipeline and hopefully share as much as I can to take home that crown. You also have an interview, which is 10 minutes long, nine and a half minutes with a 30 second closing. And that could be political, current events, education events, yourself, your social impact. Anything is really up for grabs during that interview. And it's very rapid fire, but I enjoy the interview process very, very much. Up next is talent, which is my personal favorite. So I am a drummer, and I have been drumming since I was eight years old. I didn't start out drumming by choice, actually. Like I said, I played piano, but my brother bought himself an electric guitar, and he needed someone to go on and play with him. And he said, well, I've got this younger sister. She could be my bandmate. And lo and behold, he and my grandmother surprised me with a drum set for my eighth birthday, and it stuck. I didn't know what to do with it. I wanted to play flute or trumpet, but I really fell in love with it. So in high school, I could have decided to have bought a new car for myself or a new drum set. And I bought the drum set that you see in these photos, and it will be going with me to Connecticut very, very soon. Then, of course, we have our traditional red carpet, formerly known as evening wear. So this is kind of highlighting the tradition of Miss America. We are in the 100th year. It is the 100th anniversary of Miss America. And so this is kind of paying a tribute to that tradition of the glamour of what was formerly the pageant, now competition. Well, let's talk about scholarships. If you know any young women in your community, in your family, schools, anywhere from across our state, who could benefit from these scholarship dollars that are at Miss Kansas and Miss Kansas Outstanding Team, I would strongly recommend you getting them connected with this program or getting them connected with me. So every year we give out many, many cash scholarships. So in 2019, we gave away $79,000 in cash scholarships. And this year, it was just about $60,000 in cash scholarships. 10,000 of which have already be, been paid out to our candidates who are in school this year. And we also have the in-kind scholarship program, which is scholarships that our post-secondary institutions in Kansas provide to candidates just for being in the Miss Kansas program and then choosing to go to their school. So that's in pretty much all of our two-year community colleges and technical colleges, and I'm working to expand that number right now. But Personally, I've earned just over $17,000 in cash scholarships, many of those coming from my time at Miss Kansas this year. So I won scholarships based on my onstage performance and talent, my service through the Social Impact Award Initiative for education as an education major, and also for being Rookie of the Year or my first time competing. So that's all totaling from my time at Miss Kansas, a local title holder, and as Miss Kansas Outstanding Teen. And that number will only grow as I go to Miss America in about a month. So I have a job to do this year. Um, I speak to many, many people just like I'm speaking to you all today. I go to schools talking about my own social impact of music. I speak on behalf of the Department of Traffic Safety through KDOT. I work with wildlife and parks at their various events. We have a partnership with them. And I also get to go to any events that I might be requested to go to. So if you have any events, give me an email. I'd love to be there. <laughs> But my biggest passion is being a role model and having young women and men visualize that, yes, even if you're from a small town or if you're from Kansas, you can go on to do great and big, wonderful things. And that's the way it started for me at age five. So every time I'm able to make a connection with a young person in our communities, it's just so special and heartwarming, heartwarming especially as a future educator, because that's why I want to do it is for the kids and making an impact in their life so that they can see, yeah, I could be like Taylor and go on and do that too. Um, like I said, Miss America is coming up and I get to represent Kansas. So this was over Labor Day weekend at the Show Us Your Shoes Parade. So another tradition of Miss America is back in the day, they didn't wear shoes when they competed. It used to be on the beach and on the boardwalk. And I don't know about you, but I don't wear shoes to the beach. So when they started wearing shoes, it was a big deal. And they would say, hey, 
show us your shoes. So that's how the parade got its name. And I wore my K-State Van uniform because that really, I feel, represents our state well and represents me as a music major. And I have a little drumstick as the heel of my shoe there. And I thought it was a fun, fun little costume. Most of the girls wore their gowns or big beaded skirts, but I thought my band uniform fit me a little bit better. And then I have been working to really grow our in-kind scholarship program. So you guys might recognize Dr. Flanders at the Board of Regents in this photo. And we have met a couple of times now to work to expand our in-kind scholarships to our KBOR schools like K-State, KU, Hayes, WSU, on down the line to just really bring those scholarships in Kansas so that our women can stay here. As Miss Kansas Outstanding Teen, I had the opportunity to go to the University out of Alabama on a full ride scholarship, or the Manhattan School of Music, or Troy University. Again, all full ride scholarships. But I wanted to stay here in Kansas. That was very important to me because I want to ultimately teach here, so I thought it was important to network here and grow connections here. But I feel that for our teens and for our Miss who are in this program, if they have those full rides available at other schools, and four-year schools, they're probably going to make that choice. So it's my goal this year as Miss Kansas to expand the in-kind scholarship program to our state schools. I think that is so vital. And I'm very grateful to Dr. Flanders for helping me on this. Um, and if you guys have any connections, I would love to chat about that as well so we can continue to have that in our Kansas schools for our candidates. I've also been sharing my Bucket Beats program, which is where I take five gallon buckets as part of my social impact initiative pretty much everywhere I go and use music as an icebreaker to have difficult conversations around inequities, hardships, mental health, current events, and use music and drumming as a way to kind of break down those barriers and allow people to have free conversations. So I did this at a USA Kansas event very recently. I was also here at KSDE not too long ago before I started my school tour. And then, of course, I've been in the schools, um, taking this to lots of other philanthropy groups, hopefully very soon. And I've just enjoyed it. And I always ask the same three questions when I do this activity. The first being, how do you use music in your everyday life? And I get a lot of answers revolving around mental health and the positive effects that music has on our minds and our bodies and our hearts. I also ask, what does unity mean to you? Because that is what this exercise is all about, is building and creating unity so that the participants who do this program can work together to achieve a common goal to unite us all, whether that be in their school, in their community, or even at their home. My last question for everyone who does this activity is, is there anything bothering you today? Is there anything that you want to share with me or share with someone else? And then how can you take steps to solve that problem and or get help for that problem so that this isn't just a one-time event? And lastly, I have a drumstick sponsor, and they have given me drumsticks, posters, lanyards that I can give to people and have a lasting physical reminder of that experience. So if they're ever feeling that issue or that problem again, they can just look at those drumsticks or those stickers and think, oh yeah, Miss Taylor taught me that music can help me solve this problem if I'm just willing to put in the work to make that happen. So that's a large part of what I do as Miss Kansas is take that into our schools and community events, um, also boardrooms, so that people can use the power of music as truly a transformative thing to ignite unity across our country and across our world. Um, and like I mentioned, I also travel on behalf of KDOT with the Seatbelt Safety Program. It's called SAFE, Seatbelts Are For Everyone. And this year I'm focusing, of course, on seatbelt usage, but also on drowsy and distracted driving because as Miss Kansas, I'm on the road pretty frequently and I'm up late, up early, and Drowsy driving affects me and it affects us all. So that's the cause I'm championing with them this year as well. But I've really enjoyed my time as Miss Kansas so far. We're almost to the halfway point, which seems kind of crazy to me. It's only been since July, but I hope that you'll all join me in watching Miss America on December 16th. And if you're interested in going to Miss Kansas next year, it'll be the first weekend in June. 
So I'd love if you connect on social media. I have Instagram, Facebook, and of course our website where you can stay up to date on everything. And then that QR code in the bottom corner is if you know anyone who's interested in volunteering, um, competing, being a part of our mentoring program, if you want to fill that out for them or send it on, that's what that's for. So thank you all for having me today. It's been a pleasure speaking with you all. Well, thank you. I need to admit that I haven't watched the Miss America contest contests in decades, I think I'll make an exception this year. <laughs> and very, uh, ex extremely impressive presentation. I open the floor to my colleagues. Any comments? Ben. I don't know if your computer is up and running. I'm assuming these are still working. Um, first of all, I didn't know that if we volunteered for that thing that we'd get plastered all over a board meeting. And when you're at one of those superintendent vi visits, and the superintendent at a small school knows you play, you get recruited really quickly. <laughs> uh, but, uh, and I walked in there and said, where's the buckets? <laughs> um, in terms of that, because it's time that all of you get blackmailed too. Uh, um, in terms of that, but I, I appreciate the presentation. This was a really brief one compared to the one that we attended with, with uh, at the Council of Soups meeting. Um, with that, and I appreciate the work that you do, and and look forward to seeing you in our Kansas classrooms, uh, earnestly, because we need we need teachers. In case you don't know that, um, so and I know Dr. Norman, we need teachers too. So if you if you want to grab a teacher's license, <laughs> he's all over that. So, uh, but I appreciate what you're doing and the message, and we wish you the best of luck. Thank you. Again, we thank you very much, and I think we're supposed to have a picture now. Is that right, Ann? So we will, and by the way, board members, this is not a break, so we're going to take a picture and come right back to your seats.
very glad to have Dr. Norman with us today, but first, before we introduce him, uh, Janet Wall is going to give us some information about the Kansas Confidence in Public Education Task Force. Thank you, Mr. Chair. Uh, am I coming through, I wonder? Oh, I gotta do this. <laughs> Thank you. Okay, uh, I, was, I was asked to talk about the uh, Confidence in Kansas Public Education Task Force, as you all know. I am the board member who represents you on the Confidence in Kansas ta Education Task Force, and I just want to thank you for allowing me to do this because this is honestly one of the best committees there is because we do nothing but recognize people, honor people, honor schools, and it's just very exciting. But I just want to tell you a little bit about the task force. Uh, the primary purpose of it uh, was to strengthen confidence in Kansas public education and to increase awareness of the positive impacts of public education on the, on the state. It was created in 1981. I was not here then, regardless of what anyone says. <laughs> and, uh, anyway, and to, and to uh, promote uh, cooperation among state education agencies, bring recognition to volunteers, uh, serving public education in Kansas, and to uh, heighten awareness of the important role of public education in our society. We have uh, the, the Confidence in Kansas Public Education does several things. We have Friends of Education where we have recognized people who have volunteered in various ways. We have the Challenge Awards. I think you're all very aware of those. You've presented a lot of those. The Governor's Scholars. That's a fun one that we enjoy. And hopefully this year we're going to be able to do it in person. But we also have what's called the ABC Award. And this is an award that, this is an award that is uh, presented annually to an individual or an, or an organization that's provided a long-term contribution, had a significant impact, or dem demonstrated an uncommon commitment to public education across the state. Uh, we have had some amazing people uh, receive this. I'm not going to name all of them, but I'd just like to tell you our first recipient was Dr. Carl Menninger, the Menninger Foundation. We've had uh, several uh, businesses, uh, the uh, Ewing Kaufman Foundation, uh, the uh, Wesley Foundation, the Kansas Bankers Association, just all kinds, several board members, uh, many educators, legislators, just to name a few. There's a whole list of them. If you'd like to see it, I'd be more than happy to share it with you, or it's on the website. But at this time, I would like to re uh, introduce G.A. Bowie, who is the chair of our task force, and G.A., it's your turn. Thank you. Well, thank you, Janet. I appreciate the uh, opportunity to visit with you. And Chairman Porter, thanks for the time today. Uh, again, uh, Janet explained it very well, who, who we are as the Conference of Public Education Task Force. We do represent eight organizations, uh, the, your school, the State School Board, the Kansas School Board Association, the Kansas Activity, High School Activity Association, uh, Kansas NEA, Kansas PTA, USA Kansas, United School Administrators of Kansas, the League of Women Voters and the American Association of uh, University Women. So it's a very diverse organization. And uh, you know, education is one of those items that if you're the receiver of the education, it seems very simple. If you're our students sitting in a classroom, education seems very simple to them. Um, but we know from the outside, it takes many individuals to make it successful. And as you guys are very well aware of that uh, over the last 20 months, uh, the pandemic's made it very difficult. Uh, to conduct education, especially in our traditional manner. And so this year, the Conference of Public Education Task Force, in a unanimous way, would like to recognize uh, our Secretary of the uh, Kansas Environment, Health and Environment Association, or Kansas, uh, <laughs> the Department of, thank you, uh, the Department of, um, the um, Department of Health and Environments here in Kansas, and Dr. Lee Norman, as this year's recipient of the ABC Award. Uh, without their leadership, uh, advice, uh, just just in kind, just the uh, the work that they did on on the backside of education, we would not be able to bring our kids back to school safely and our educators back safely. So, Dr. Norman, on behalf of the Kansas Conference of Public Education Task Force, we thank you for your service and thank you. For your <laughs> Now, Dr. Norman, we recognize the fact that we lied to you to get you. Uh -huh. <laughs> <laughs> no, 
oh my gosh, you. <laughs> You're the biggest liar of them all. <laughs> yeah, I didn't see this coming. Uh, uh, I'm touched. The, uh, this guy's to blame for a lot of it. You all are to blame for a lot of this really good work that's been done. And thank you so much for all of your leadership. Randy and his staff and my, my staff and I have been grafted at the hip for 646 straight days. We've, our battle rhythm has been 24-7, 365. And we've never left each other's side one way or the other. And we've had to invent everything we've done as we've gone along. We've invented it together. We've invented it with the superintendents. We've tried to keep the control and the influence where it needs to be most effective. At local levels, working with local teachers, we recognize and the sanctity of education and public education and K through 12 education. And just said if that was always has been an overarching goal of ours was to be safe and to have our kids be safe, our teachers, our staff, and to, to follow the data, follow the science, but recognizing that everything has a consequence and how do you provide that balance in there? And I won't say we had acrimonious moment, but we certainly had times of disagreement during this and always came out the other end saying, this is something we can make work. And uh, I couldn't hope for a better staff in my own agency and certainly Randy and his uh, group and you guys and other education organizations through the state uh, have really, we've tried to follow your lead uh, with the best science and the best public health advice, the governor's office and the governor, of course, have been lead policymakers as well. And uh, I'm just extremely grateful. I certainly, I didn't see this coming, but I want you to know personally, I'm very grateful. And Randy, for you and your staff, thank, thank you so much for providing uh, the, the partner through this whole thing. It really meant a lot. And uh, Chairman Porter, thank you very much. Well, except for the fact we lied to you, we really appreciate you being here today. <laughs> and we would also like uh, a picture uh, okay. with you. And once again, this is not a break. We will come right back. <laughs> yeah, when, when teachers and people who work with teachers say this is not a break, I know what that means. <laughs> I have to, have to behave. <laughs>
next we are we have an action item to act on the higher education program standards for deaf and hard of hearing apparently Catherine is going to start we go right ahead yes sir uh, chairman Porter Commissioner Watson members of the board uh, thank you for letting us come before you to present new and revised standards for preparation of teachers for deaf and hard of hearing uh, they were presented as an information item last month so I have with me Joan Macy from Kansas School from the Deaf and Dr. Sally Roberts, both from the committee that revised these standards to answer any questions you might have about them. Do you have any questions about the standards? Janet. Thank you, Mr. Chair. Uh, at our last meeting when you made the presentation, we discussed the fact that we possibly may have a school in Kansas that will be instructing this. Has, has there been any uh, have any confirmation or any, any information regarding that? Yes, we do have one. I'll let Joan speak to that. We did follow up, so we'd have an answer for you. Thank yes. You. Yes, we are currently in discussions with Emporia State University. Emporia State has a very strong teacher's college, and we want strong teacher candidates who then continue on as teachers of the deaf. But they also have instructors who have background and experience in deaf education, as well as ASL classes, American Sign Language classes. So we feel like they've got a lot of the foundational skill sets already in place that then we can tap into. And then just kind of, they'll have the foundation, and we can just kind of add on those nice trimmings of the specialty of deaf education. And the, uh, my computer is working again if you want to ask questions. Okay. The big question, if this is approved today, when's the first teacher ready? <laughs> okay, um, I, will, I will speak to it kind of in an overall perspective from higher education. Every university is different. I can tell you, however, having worked with the individual, the professor at Emporia State, who through all of this has been interested they were part of the push and we did know that we just couldn't tell you until we'd gotten an okay that they have many things in place so they are they won't be starting from scratch so what they'll need to do now is look at what they have what new courses have to be developed um, you can hopefully the initial courses will be the ones that they have in place because you can begin to look at students and bringing students in, what it will require is they'll have to write a program that will have uh, the course list, syllabi for the courses, um, the order that those will be given, and then uh, all of the outline of how they will measure that their candidates are meeting these standards. That will then come uh, to Catherine and I am hopeful that they may be able to get that ready usually we look at those kind of programs in the fall and in the spring about March if they could really ramp up so that they could get it to us and I feel certain I probably will chair that committee um, when it comes in to KSDE We'll, we have a good group we can pull together to review the program. We can do that in about a day. Realistically, that's what we do. We come in and do intensive work looking at it um, and then get back to them and say, it's good, but fill this hole. If they can do that, maybe by fall, they could begin entering their first students. So that would be the most ambitious, but again, They've been anticipating this, so it's not like they're going to be saying, okay, what do we have? They already know what they have and what they're going to have to add. Okay, so is this a, a license or an endorsement? It will be an endorsement. And so it will take less than four years? Oh, oh definitely. Yeah. They'll probably look at trying to do it in uh, three semesters. Four max would so probably some, be. So that's, it's a possibility that sometime in 2023, we can start having people and 
ready to do this? Um, yes. Uh, let's say they brought students in in, tw in 2022. Uh, they could maybe by the end of a summer session of 2023, um, I'm sorry, yeah, 2023, they could perhaps have their first students coming for in for or er, coming up for licensure. My brief experience in uh, higher education, uh, they moved the speed of a slug. <laughs> <laughs> I'm uh, very encouraged with what you said. What right. you said the time frame was because that is contrary to uh, to my experience. But my uh, experience in higher education was very brief. Well, and and that can happen, but. Um, it depends on who you have at your helm, I guarantee you. When I was the associate dean over teacher at KU, I didn't let any snails go. <laughs> so, And the person who took my place is also pushing, too. So uh, realistically, Jim, we can't afford to, to rest on those kinds of things that slowed everything down, not in 2021. We just can't do it. We have, we have needs in the field. We have needs by students who need to come in. They need to be able to do these things in a timely manner. Uh, we can't afford to be elitist any longer at universities. It just can't happen. Now, after the vote today, assuming we approve this, uh, I would imagine that there are people sitting at this table that would be willing to help the expediting process uh, other than, you know, our responsibilities don't necessarily end when we vote. And, uh, Great. and if there are things that we can do to help with that process, assuming this passes. Right. Uh, and it would, then, then whoever I'll, chooses to do it, I mean, Emporia will, is planning on it. It will ultimately come back, as you recall, when we get those new programs uh, they ultimately come to you for a vote then uh, once they've been through our KSDE process. So you will be involved in and the then, rest of it. And then Catherine can help encourage them to. Yes, <laughs> yes absolutely. absolutely. Okay, Michelle. Thank you, Chairman Porter. This is on. Um, thank you again for coming today. Uh, I'm, on that, I'm on a task force that we're talking about um, the need, for, for, especially for KSD. Um, and we're, one of the things we're doing is tapping into the students that are already interested in doing this. Uh, we have, like, I think, 120 in Olathe that are taking these classes up through at least three years of, of um, a, at least ASL, so they're interested in that. And then their uh, St. James Academy is also offering up to four years. Um, yes. They have a long way to go because they've kind of assessed those kids. They have, mm -hmm. they have room, room for improvement, but at least, at least we have people that are interested and we can keep them hopefully right here in Kansas. And... And, and, and get them into education and they have the passion for it and maybe even um, let them know about service. I mean, we want those, not, you know, right. not only in t as teachers, but as also in the service industry as well, using ASL. So I agree. Thank you so much. That's super. Yes, yeah, so we'll, we'll, we're staying engaged and we're on top of it. <laughs> That's wonderful. Thank you. If there are no further questions, the motion would be in order. Do you want to make it? It is, moved that the, it is moved that the Kansas Board of Education approve the new educator preparation program standards for deaf, hard of hearing, birth through third grade, uh, pre-K through 12. Second. Is there a second? Uh, everybody seconds it. We'll give it to Dina. Uh, any further discussion? All in favor, please raise your hand. All opposed? That is a unanimous vote. So we will expect a, a report. Uh, we'll expect kids enrolled by... March. Great. <laughs> and your yeah. unanimous support is so appreciated by this this group and the group that worked on these standards. You know, we work really hard and we're thrilled that you thought we did a good job. We do some things that were hard. This was not. <laughs> good. Good. Thank, Thank, you. Thank you. Thank you. Bert and Jennifer. Jennifer will be remote. We're going to have a quarterly report from SEAC. Welcome, sir.
Is the microphone working? Yes, I hear the echo. Um, Special Education Advisory Council has been very active this year. One of the things that we are currently working on is setting targets for the 2020-2025 State Performance Plan Annual Performance Report. But before we go through the targets that we're setting, which we will do at the next meeting, that quarterly meeting when we meet with the board, we want to go over our 2019 results with you. So next slide, please. Do I push a button? Which one? There we go. So we submitted this in January of 2021, and this was our 2019, fiscal year 2019 uh, data that we submitted to the federal government. We will submit our 20 data uh, February 1st of 2022. So I gave you these handouts so you could follow along with these indicators. This is what we're held accountable for for students with disabilities. We have to meet these indicator requirements and some are performance requirements, some are compliance requirements. I will clarify that to you. So when we look at graduation rates, we're looking at the graduation of students with disabilities in a four-year cohort. Um, this makes it a little difficult because we have some students that don't complete the curriculum and go on to 21-year-old, and then they either get a certificate of attendance or at 21, their services in. There's a small percent of those students. We also have 18 to 21 year old services. I want to clarify they are not programs, which many districts will enroll them in a program. They are individualized to the needs of each individual student. Indicator two is our dropout rate. Um, where you see when I get to the next slide where it says slippage, I'll explain that to you. But dropout is figured on how many students did not complete from the freshman class that was enrolled four years ago. And so then we look at the completers four years later and we see which students are not there anymore and have not enrolled somewhere else or out of state or whatever, and that's considered to be our dropouts. Our next area is our participation for students with IEPs in the assessments. 95% is what we're trying to capture here, and we came pretty close to that during COVID but all of our indicators this next year will have a COVID impact statement. Then we have proficiency for students with IEPs. Uh, we have the suspension expulsion data, which is a compliance indicator. That means we're supposed to have 100% or 0%. Uh, we do have a 1% opportunity to be in a range. We have suspension by race ethnicity as a 4B. Under five, we have education environments. By the way, we have four subsections under five. Uh, we go with students that are in the general education program 80% of the time, students that are pulled out more than 60% of the time. Those are the two biggies that we look at. Uh, preschool environments and indicator six is the least restrictive environment. What we're looking for is students to be enrolled with general education preschoolers who are in normal general education preschool programs rather than a specialized classroom for students. So per parent involvement, um, this is where we send a survey out to our parents and we ask them, were you engaged in the process of special education with your child? Indicator nine is disproportionate representation. Do we have students with disabilities disproportionately identified incorrectly? And then we look at the race ethnicity of students uh, and whether or not there is a race or an ethnicity that is overly identified uh, disproportionately. 11 is child find. That is a compliance indicator. We are to uh, find the students that are out there that need special education services and provide that service. They have to have an evaluation within 60 school days once the parent gives consent for the evaluation. If they go beyond the 60 days, then they're found non-compliant. 12 is early childhood transition. Infant toddler services gives a 90 day notice to the school based services that says we have a child turning three in 90 days. You have a meeting with the parent, you get an evaluation document signed, you determine if the child's eligible and they have to be on an IEP by their third birthday. We had two districts by the way this year that did not meet that. Uh, they will receive a, a flag for compliance. Secondary transition is 
do, does the IEP have measurable secondary goals? And we have several areas we look at under secondary transition. Post-school outcomes is a year after the student is out of school, we contact the student through a cohort method, which will change in 2025 to where we look at a broader perspective. And we find out if that child is enrolled in higher education, if they have a, a job, exactly what's going on with that child once they exit. The resolution sessions is if we offer resolution sessions as part of the dispute resolution, which means that the parent and the school decide to sit down and mediate, which is 16. And that would be where we mediate and was the mediation successful and it did it result in a signed agreement with the parent and the school. The 17, we have chosen reading uh, as our area that we want to address in the state systemic improvement plan. We go through our multi-tiered system of support people. It's a very involved process and you will see our data is going to reflect from 19, which is the 1920 school year. We were not able to measure that because we didn't have the spring data. So I'll go to the next slide. So now you see if we met the target or if we didn't meet the target. We have multiple years to meet a target. So once in a while we do have slippage and I'm afraid that during the COVID time, we had slippage more than we've ever had before on our indicators. And that means that from the year before, we regressed more than 1%. We will have a COVID impact statement that we will provide uh, in our report, but during 19, this is what we had. We had slippage for those first two. We had no data for assessments. We had no slippage for suspension expulsion or for the educational environments. We had slippage for preschool environments, which means that students went to more of a home-based or less than being served in a preschool environment. COVID had an impact on that when all schools closed. For preschool outcomes, we did have some slippage. That's where we look at social emotional, we look at behavior, and we look at knowledge. And there, those three areas get measured under seven. Parent involvement, no slippage, no slippage in disproportionate representation or in child fine, or early childhood secondary transition. And we did have some slippage in our post-school outcomes. And COVID had a lot to do with that. Resolution sessions and mediation no slippage, and again, just like for assessments, we had no data for our state systemic improvement plan. So state level of determination in 2019, Kansas received the highest level of determination possible. We received uh, for more than 10 consecutive years, we think for 14, we've met requirement, knocking on wood that I am not the jinx that brings about that we don't meet requirements. Uh, we are strong in our graduation rate for students with disabilities and in compliance, and our areas of growth for Kansas are children with disabilities who dropped out and scoring at basic or above on the NAEP. So fiscal year 2020, 2025, we sought stakeholder input. We went around the state. Of course, most of this was done by Zoom, by phone. We solicited input from parents, from uh, different uh, agencies in the state. Families Together was a real big support to us to help us get parent outreach. And Laura met with three parent groups so that we could get more parent uh, response. So we heard from educators and families, and from that we set targets. So we have PowerPoints available to you, and because of our time today, I didn't think that an hour of going through each of these targets would be appropriate. Thought you might be a little tired by now. So if you would like to review the PowerPoints, we have one for our data visualizations, which is our Tableau reader, and it gives you a really nice little graph that shows you what our aim line is and what we're aiming for. And then you'll see our targets that we are setting. When I come back in February, and by the way, this mask is pulling my breath away from me, so I'm sorry if I sound a little breathy. But what we're dealing with then is you'll have that PowerPoint to look at our targets. You'll have that PowerPoint to look at our Tableau uh, for visualizations. And then there's my contact and Jennifer's, and Jennifer is going to review for you. Thank you. Jennifer is going to review outcomes from our September SEAC meeting. So, Jennifer, I'm going to turn it over to you now. All right, thanks, Bert. 
So um, when, the, when the council met on, when the Special Education Advisory Council met on September 16th, much of our work that day uh, was involved the review and discussion of the state performance plan and annual performance report. Um, and as an outcome of that discussion um, about indicator one, which are the graduation rates for students with IEPs, um, was an inquiry and subsequent approval of a SEAC member um, joining KSDE's graduation task force. And then um, discussion on indicator two, um, which were the dropout rates for students with IEPs. Um, some of that discussion resulted in um, in a note be I'm sorry in a note um, being added to the reports in the Tableau Public um, the report the uh, links that Bert was sharing with you before to explain the change in data um, source because there was a source change from using Sped Pro data to using ESEA data and that resulted in an apparent increase in the percentage of students dropping out um, so that data change definitely had an impact there. And following discussion of indicator 14, the post-school outcomes, SEAC requested data on states that are doing well in this area and the strategies that those states are using in order to get that, um, those responses back compared to what Kansas is doing. Um, because in Kansas, what we're doing is that uh, one third of students are contacted one year after graduation, either by a contractor or by the school staff, depending on what the district has chosen to do. Um, and then there to see whether they're enrolled in a higher education post or post secondary program or if they're competitively employed. So we want to know what other states are doing there. Um, raw numbers on historical data were also added to Tableau Public to help um, people understand that data. Um, aside from the reviewing those documents, um, SEAC also accepted the recommendations. I'm sorry, after reviewing those documents. SEAC accepted the recommendations of the Kansas State Department of Education for proposed baselines and targets uh, on the state performance plan and annual performance report indicators and approved the proposed baseline and targets as they were presented. And outside of that work, the, the council was so updated on emergency safety interventions or ESI um, as KSDE and TASN have focused on new ways to train district staff on the definition of restraint and timelines for reporting, as well as clarifying Kansas rules for ESI training, which don't always align with those national programs we're using to do that training. Those are the highlights that I had. Thanks, Jennifer. So that's what we brought to you this month. Do you have any questions for us? Are there questions? You do have board representation on SEAC. Jim McNeese is your representative. So if you want to follow up with Jim and he can let us know if there are any items that we need to provide you more information. Thank you, Chair Porter. Um, forgive me, I'm, I'm forming the question here. Um, so COVID's impact on individual students had to be significant. And you talked about the impacts of COVID. So are, are there additional opportunities that are being designed for these students? Can you speak just a little bit to that? Yes, what we're looking at is recovery services and every student's IEP this year is supposed to incorporate a discussion about did that child have a learning lag that was a result of COVID. Keep in mind that what we advised our special education directors to do was to keep services uh, going during the time of COVID. In fact, many schools opened up their doors and had students with disabilities come to school. That's one of the reasons why I think you see that in the state assessments that students with disabilities actually had a growth in their scores. And I think it's because a lot of them were not disrupted by the pandemic. However, we had students that did not come back. We had students that did not, we don't know where they went. And so those are the students that we've been trying to locate and find. But we do know that for some of our students that were at home and supposedly receiving hybrid instruction or online instruction, that unless they had an adult guiding and leading their educational program, many of them were distracted or they did not get online to attend the classes. That was documented. I mean, that just happened. It happened in general ed, it happened in special education. So this year is our year to measure 
the growth because we have something called extended school year, which is a maintaining of skill sets that's provided during breaks in school. But this is totally different. Some people look at it as compensatory education. Compensatory education is normally provided when you have lost some sort of a dispute resolution and the hearing officer gives compensatory education to the child. But what we're calling it is recovery services. So some of them are trying to double up services this year or looking at after school programs or looking at an actual summer program, which is not extended school year, but incorporates an educational plan aligned with the child's IEP. We have to do that, Melanie, it's required. Absolutely, and so just to recap, all of that is documented in the IEP? Yes. Awesome, all right, thank you, that's helpful. Janet. Thank you, Mr. Chair. Uh, my concern, uh, and I don't, I just like to hear you uh, respond to this. My concern is a shortage of teachers. Uh, it's my, and I, I, we got waivers, probably more than I've ever seen today. We have uh, emergency subs who are serving in these positions, and then also the lack of parents. And and I have even talked with some schools that are having challenges. Filling, you know, doing, filling, fulfilling the IEP because of parents because they simply don't have them. So, I mean, uh, I guess, uh, is there anything we can do to help? Or, because I'm very concerned about this. I know, you know, we need more teachers, but this is getting, this is really getting scary. Janet, we've spent a lot of time with our directors on our webinars. I have monthly webinars with directors. We have a community of practice that. We have an outside facilitator assist us to provide for directors. We have quarterly special education meetings. We had one in July, we had one in October, we'll have another in January and one in April. And what we discuss is what to do about the student needs that are going unmet as a result of not having staff. So we are dealing with an extreme shortage in special education. Most of our systems have managed, and I'm gonna say managed, to get a body in a classroom. But unfortunately, we have substitute teachers that are working with students with disabilities. We have paras that are now enrolled in programs. So not only are they accountable for an interrelated resource room of students that may have autism, behavior disorders, learning disabilities, significant disabilities, but they're also taking seven hours of college classes. So yes, we have huge concern. So what my guidance to the field has been document whenever a student is not receiving the services that are listed in the IEP and work with the parent on how we can provide that compensatory time that we've missed out providing that service to avoid litigation or formal complaints or due process hearings because it is what it is. And they are desperate to get people to come. Now the ESSER funds have really helped us to be able to promote salaries. So our para salaries, our para benefits are probably higher than they've been in most of our agencies if they take advantage of the COVID ESSER funds. COVID impact has definitely caused this problem. We had a huge number of people retire last year. These were our quality educators who've been in the field for many, many years and they've left the, the field altogether. So now we're having to train up so I'm also concerned about our data points for our kids, but not from a data point, but from a student learning point. I always look at the students first. The data is what it is, but we need to educate these children to the best of our ability to meet the board outcomes. We need to have trained professionals in the classrooms. We need paraprofessionals that have skill sets that can provide a lot of learning opportunities that go above and beyond what the normal pair is able to provide. These are all things we address during those meetings. Well, I appreciate it. I just wanted to notice if there's anything you think we can do to help. I mean, what I notice is that the kids are in care at all that because of the particular special education. So, you know, I understand it, but I, I trust that in you. I know you are doing everything that you like. So, thank you for, and thank everyone else. But if there's anything we can do, please let us know. Janet, I think that the board has been very reasonable in their allowance of substitutes to be claimed for 0.67 FTE for the entire year where before they may have been a 0.16 or whatever. You definitely have stretched the limits of what we would consider reasonable within accommodating those people that are serving our students. 
So I think you've done that, but we really need the highly qualified people in those classrooms. And so somehow or other, we're gonna have to build a program of future teachers where we start with high school students, the, the best minds, and we give them scholarships to be able to go to school and not have a cost for that. Instead of them going into other programs, let's promote education. I know that we get beat up a lot when you think about the legislature, when you think about those opportunities for people to be opposed to public education. It's the best deal we have. If we could get our brightest students to enroll in education, what a wonderful thing that would be. So I think that's something we can work with the legislature on is how can we find funding to provide these students with scholarship opportunities. And we have to start now because four years from now we're going to have this same problem. Thank you. You're welcome. Ann. Thank you, Mr. Chair. I just have a couple questions. You know, um, I forget how many, a couple years ago we approved this unified degree so you have a bachelor's and coming out and teach special ed. Is that producing student uh, teachers yet or are they too early in the pipeline, do you know? That's a question for Michelle Miller. And I don't know that Michelle is available to answer that because I don't know how many programs that currently offer that unified. I know it was made available, but I don't know how many universities really implemented that type of a program. Okay, um, and I, 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 we might have missed a, a good bet not using more CARES money to offer scholarships or pay off student loans to you know students to, you could certainly make a connection between that need and COVID. Um, my other question was, you know, I had some districts, you know, you said some brought the special ed kids in, which made perfect sense because there wasn't anybody else in the building. But I had some districts that said, gosh, we didn't even consider that, you know, we didn't bring them in. And I'm thinking, how do these kids get services at home over a computer? That doesn't work. And so my question is, are some of our districts in trouble for essentially not providing services during COVID? I think what you will find is their data is going to reflect that the loss in student learning is going to be huge and they're going to have to find a way to make up for learning loss now mm -hmm. and next year and the following year. I think those agencies, because we advertised heavily that special education students could be brought into the building as mm -hmm. long as they were in small groups, social distancing, the masking, et cetera. So if they said they weren't aware of it, then I don't know that they were paying attention to anything that was being shared with them by this board, by KSDE, or by my department. Because okay. we definitely let them know that they could. A lot of them felt so stressed by the pandemic that they just didn't buy into it and they didn't do it. Well, now they're going to have to address that compensatory education for those children. So what's the penalty? I mean... The penalty will be that they'll have a hearing officer tell them that they have to compute Mm -hmm. how much time each student missed, and then provide opportunity for that time to be made up on an individual basis. Okay, thank it's you. It's already Anna. happening through formal complaints. By really? Way. Okay. Yes. Thank you. Thank you, Mr. Chair. Certainly, Ben. Thank you, Mr. Chair. Um, I know that um, the vice chair had talked about staff in, in the classrooms. Another concern that I have is the change in directors. Um, I already know of three changing over in the state, and that's really early for that, that they're actually looking over, and, and half of mine have changed just in my district in my term in three years in terms of SPED directors. So, um, and I know you walk through the meetings and stuff, but about recruiting SPED directors and, and the larger piece about, I mean, even our school administrators, I know that's a concern that we have, but I know we're talking about SPED specifically, but I know that's another concern and, and, and recruiting those as well. SEAC has looked at licensure for directors, and there was a recommendation to have a director license, and SEAC voted to not move that forward because it seemed to be more restrictive than it needed to be. But that is an option, and yes, I am concerned. We had 19, that's one of the reasons why we do the training program that we do. We had 19 new directors in 2019. We had 13 in 2020. We've got another 12 this year, just like superintendents where there are more than 50. So we have all these young administrators that are coming in and they don't have that background knowledge that really helps when you're dealing with students with disabilities. So yes, we're trying to do everything we can to provide professional development to the field and really provide mentoring to our new directors. 
I have TA providers. We have nine retired directors that are working for us through technical assistance, and they are assigned to work with new directors upon request and provide them opportunities to be successful in their jobs. Jim. Bert, thank you for your uh, presentation, and I just want to follow up on the last topic. Uh, it's been years, years, 40 years that I've been in this business, and uh, administrators have not been adequately prepared for the challenges and the tasks that they're going to be required under the law, and quite frankly, just in the meeting the needs of students in special education. And I think we need to, maybe you and I, because of my relationship to be the representative on SEAC, to uh, take that and be a little bit bolder and more forthright and more demanding of colleges and universities and school preparation programs for administrators and teachers in their preparation uh, to provide services uh, to special needs students, no, number one. <clears throat> number two, uh, having said that, Kansas has, very, has always had a very high rate of graduation uh, for special education students. Every once in a while, we're even the top of the nation. You know, and congratulations to uh, uh, you and your staff and for all the people around the state for doing that. Uh, but we really do need to uh, keep focused on the future and the shortcomings that we have right now. Graduation rate is great, but they need more than that. Their services need to be better than that, just the graduation rate. So thank you, and I look forward to uh, challenging the board and challenging the state in the preparation of administrators and teachers for special education uh, requirements and duties in their jobs. You can comment about that if you'd like. Well, my comment has been that I don't want students getting a diploma that takes them to the couch. So I have really put a lot of effort into transition services and transition planning. We put together a transition document for the state that includes a lot of agency supports it has QR codes, so you can hit the QR code and you go immediately to a resource. We're working with BR for pre-employment transition services. We have an agreement now. Finally, it took two years, but we have an agreement, and we're working with them to provide supports and services that BR can come in and work on whatever the targets of students are. They have regional support networks for that. So we are building capacity, but we have a long way to go. Betty, did you have a question? I, I did, um, and I had canceled it, but since you called on me, uh, Chairman Ford, I'll go ahead and ask my question. In the area of the lost child, uh, and you were saying that many of them didn't, just didn't return, was that a significant increase because of COVID or uh, is that just kind of a normal pattern? I would say it's significant, Betty, and COVID did have an impact we have families that decided they did not want their children coming back to public school. And this national debate over mask or no mask has driven a lot of parents to make decisions about whether or not they want their child in school or not. Medically fragile children where there's no masking, they want the masks. Um, that's been an issue. Also, you have children that can't wear masks and then you have a mask mandate. That has caused concern for parents. So we don't know if they're homeschooling their child, if they are privately providing for their child's education. But this is a general education loss as well. We have many general education students that have not returned to school yet, as well as the, a percent right. of special ed. So it is concerning to us to try and find those students. And we've challenged our districts to reach out and see if they can find them and see if it was parental choice. We also have a school, uh, homeschool, phone line that we have here at KSDE and we keep track of that and that has gone substantially up. Last year we had 4,000 parents decide to do homeschooling. This year it's over 2,000. Now we don't know how many students are in each of those homeschools, but that could make up for quite a few of those students that did not re-enroll. So is there, what is the coordinated effort then um, when you're trying to find out exactly what the status, I would imagine many parents that were um, concerned because of, of a medically fragile um, student or other issues uh, 
where wearing a mask was difficult, uh, would not really want to report that information. And I wondered how much of a challenge that might provide. We have asked our directors to reach out and try and find all of the students that did not re-enroll. They're having difficulty contacting parents. So we don't know if they left to go move in with a grandparent out of state and they just mm -hmm. didn't re-enroll the children. At the high school level, if the child is 16 or 17, they may have selected not to enroll in school because then they can. So a lot of issues we're looking at, Betty, to try and find out what we can do to support the field to find these missing students. Okay, thank you. I was uh, pleased to hear you talking about the different, the, the additional resources available uh, for school district in transition. You know, that's one of my interests. Uh, are you seeing school districts taking advantage of those, of, of those, uh, those resources? That's a great question. Uh, what we're doing is we're following it up on Friday when I provide the webinar. That will be my topic is are you using the transition document, make it available to them again. And also we have uh, Tracy Flowers from VR Prietz who will be providing a presentation during our quarterly meeting in January so that we can make sure our directors and our teachers are aware that we do have Prietz available and that they need to be allowing it under the memo of understanding, Prietz is allowed in their building and they need to work it out so that these kids have access to those supports and services. So yes, we are finding that people are utilizing it, but we're gonna reinforce it again in our upcoming two opportunities when we meet with directors. And I appreciate that very much because that's, that's, that's an area where we were not doing well. And uh, I thought so too when I came here and that's why I emphasized it. And, uh, and we're missing out on, and if we're gonna meet the needs of each student, uh, that's, that's an area that because we're committed to each, uh, as you well know, as, as I've known you for 20 years, have been. Uh, and so I want to make sure that, that we translate that to everybody else. So appreciate that. Thank you very much. You're welcome. At this point, we will take a break and we will reconvene at 3 o'clock. <laughs>
The next two items deal with legislative matters and then our um, legislative uh, positions, which we will vote on at some point this afternoon. I also think that it is important that during this discussion, we also discuss maybe the reaction uh, to our meeting with the legislators and how we can move forward to better develop positive relationships, if possible, with the legislature. But we will start with Craig. Apologize. Typically, with legislative matters, we have four or five handouts for you. I don't have any paper to give you today, so sorry don't about that. Yeah. yeah, you're welcome. Um, I'd like to tell you that will continue, but I won't make that promise. Just share a little information for you. Obviously, the legislature doesn't meet until January, but through the summer and particularly in the fall, there are a number of interim committees that meet, and some of those deal with legislative matters. Um, one was the Legislative Budget Committee. And while that's obviously not directed specifically to education, they did hear from the department, uh, Brad and John Hess, visited with them, uh, gave them an overdue, or, I'm sorry, an overview and an update on the ESSER and the EANS funds, how that was being distributed, how school districts were using the funds, um, reviewed the state board's response on the ESSER funding request that was in House Bill 2134. So that request uh, for you to direct the uh, ESSER funds towards school safety and security grants, towards the mental health intervention team program, and towards communities and schools. They just reviewed the letter that you approved uh, earlier in the spring, uh, explaining why that did not happen. And then they reviewed with that committee remote learning and COVID-19 quarantine policies and practices that school districts have in place. So they'd have an idea of how the quarantines are working and how the remote learning law that was passed last spring impacts that uh, and the authority that local school boards have to exempt individual students from the 40 hour limit. So that was the legislative budget committee met with them one time uh, back in October. There is also a mental health modernization and reform committee and that group has met for several years now. Um, and they are very interested in the mental health intervention team pilot program. It's chaired by Representative Landwehr. We have uh, met with that committee twice so far and just reviewed what's happened in the program for the last four years. We're now in the fourth year. We started with nine school districts in the pilot year. We're now up to 55. Uh, we had 56 for a brief time last year. One district had to drop out because they couldn't find a liaison just not enough people out there to fill those positions. Uh, but we do have 55 districts. So we just reviewed what has happened so far with the program, uh, results that school districts have found. We collect that data every year on, on how students have done uh, and shared that with the committee. And then they heard from this last time, three different districts, 489 Hayes, 233 Olathe, and 229 Blue Valley. Um, Hayes is a district that is fully involved in the mental health intervention team pilot program. Olathe uses that program as well as mental health services that they already had in place and have developed in their district. And then Blue Valley has a mental health uh, program of their own. They're not using the mental health intervention team program that the state sponsors. Uh, they have a, a contract with Children's Mercy Hospital and provide services that way. So they heard from those three districts to get an idea of the three different models. Um, and the idea is to look at how can we make that program more sustainable moving forward and how can we open it up to more school districts uh, and more involvement in what has been a very successful program. From, from all districts involved, we have yet to hear anybody say that it has not worked well for them. Uh, one piece of information did share with them while the funding for the program was not increased by the state and the state board had already directed how the ESSER funds, the 10% set aside that you had authority for, uh, had already been directed to other purposes, local school districts could use their ESSER 2 funds and ESSER 3 for that matter to address mental health. 
So far, uh, local districts have targeted uh, $21.6 million towards mental health services. So they've definitely taken advantage of the opportunity. They've used that to hire individuals, social workers, counselors, and so forth, uh, as well as increase the services that are available and provide training for staff and for students in those areas. Uh, so it has been well used, well utilized, the funding has. Uh, so we've met with that committee twice. Another committee that you've uh, probably heard a little bit about, there is a special committee on education that is chaired by Representative Christy Williams. Uh, we have been told that they will meet November 30th and December 1st. That's unofficial. We haven't uh, received official notification that those are the meeting dates, but that's when we believe they will meet. Uh, don't have an agenda yet, obviously, for the committee if we don't know the dates. The topics that were identified in the request for the committee, though, uh, were funding increases approved under the Gannon decisions, legislation related to longitudinal reporting, from 2015 to 2021, so what's, what's the data that we are required to provide to the legislature and have been providing uh, for the past several years. Achievement expectations and funding for at-risk students is one area they're interested in. Uh, Kansas State Department of Education rules and regulation updates in 2021 related to achievement. So you just updated your regulations uh, at the last meeting. They would like to know a little bit about that, or that's what they put in the request at least. Uh, the State Board of Education's legislation priorities. So those priorities that you're going to address here in just a few minutes. Uh, they have some interest in what those might be. Um, the State Department of Education priorities from the 50 Stop Success Tour that Randy and Brad made. What did we learn from that and what information would we share uh, that might be of interest to the legislature? And then finally, constitutional roles of the legislature, state board of education, and local school boards. Uh, so there are probably some items on that list that you would have in common with that committee. Uh, we have not received a request yet for any data or information related to any of those items. So I'm not sure how it will be addressed at the committee level. But they are Scheduled for two days, and as I said, unofficially, we think it's November 30th and December 1st. So we'll know more by the time you meet again in December, if that's the case. And then finally, uh, the state has a SPARC committee, Strengthening People and Revitalizing Kansas, that oversees $1.1 billion over the next three years in ARPA funds. For school districts, it's ESSER to the state. It's uh, the American Rescue Plan Act, and they have $1.1 billion available for a variety of different uses. They have four advisory panels to look at the different areas that that money could be used in. One of those is health and education. And that advisory panel is chaired by Senator Renee Erickson, and I uh, don't know when they may be meeting or how they will target those funds. Uh, but that they will have uh, some recommendations to make for their share of those funds. And that's all I have to report, Mr. Chair. I would be happy to answer any questions if I can. I just think it's important for that next to the last item on the Williams Committee about constitutional roles. Mm -hmm. uh, I would imagine that they will choose the people that make those recommendations to them, uh, which may not be in our best interest. Uh, so I think that we need to monitor that pretty carefully because we may have a contrary opinion. I'm sure there will be a number of opinions expressed, yes. Any questions for Craig? Thank you. You may want to stay for the next. I'll do that. Thank you. <laughs> and let's now have Dina and uh, Ben lead us through the legislative priorities, and then I want to discuss how to move forward with relationships. I was going to just do it from over there, but then I got to thinking, you know what? Dina's mic isn't working, so uh, do some issues. Uh, in your packets is a updated of our legislative position statements. 
nothing has changed from last month with the exception of we've added a conclusion which was at your request to add uh, but we wanted to wait till we met with the legislative leaders last month in order to put that together so that was an ad from last month is that last paragraph conclusion statement uh, which is reiterating our uh, willingness to work with and our priorities for a successful high school graduate um, and just stressing that point um, with that um, uh, there is nothing else substantial or e even any wording changes from last month as I recall, Dina. No. Nope. Most, I, actually, most of the any changes were basically changes suggested by you or by the our education lobby friends that we our partners that we work with. And it's with the understanding that when we present these. Um, and I don't know, Mr. Chair, for not coordinating with you well enough, but I think we're gonna we're gonna vote it all in its entirety. But knowing that some of these points we are not unanimous in, and and Dean and I are fully aware that we know where we have unanimity and where we just have a majority, but uh, not unanimity. And we thought the word consensus was maybe mm -hmm. a, a good word to use. So. Mm -hmm. You will see that on occasion. Mm This one, we have an hour scheduled for this, and I want to take part of that time. I would think, in order in order for us to truly know where we're unanimous and where we're not, we're going to need to go by bullet point and say, okay, like the first one, Kansas supports legislative task force to dys dyslexia. Ask for questions or comments. If there are none, ask who supports. And okay. just go. If, if so are, literally if, bullet point by bullet point. Yeah, and that way, because it's important for us, for, it's important when we make the, when, when you are representing where you, and you're asked, is this unanimous, you need to be able to answer that question honestly, and we can't do that unless we do it that way. Yes, Mr. Chair. So on the first bullet point uh, on the academic support efforts, the recommendation of legislative task force on dyslexia, including including to provide funding for a dyslexia coordinator position at KSDE. Comments, questions? And we have one, but it has been paid for with uh, ESSER funds and it will expire. So it, I think this is important to mm -hmm. continue before them. Yeah. So just, okay. you're just wanting a show of hands. Show of hands of, of who supports. How many are in okay. favor? Okay. So, Betty, just because I don't know if you heard, Jim, we're raising our hands to just show support for each of these, these items. Oh. No. It's information, yeah. I was letting Betty know because you weren't on the mic so she could let, she could hear what we were doing. Michelle. Yeah, saw that. Okay, so Ben and Dina, are we so on on that? When does mm -hmm. that expire? That 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 amount for that dyslexic coordinator? Because that would be a good uh, once if it's two years or three years or um, because that would be good to know to, to see how that's how that position is going, <laughs> and and the feedback from the dyslexic families and the, all those that have served on the task force to see how where where those funds need to go prior after that. That's we can fund that through 2024. September. September of 2024. That money would run out. So that would give us a, a lot of time to look it over and see how it's how it's fair been amount of time. Been. Yes, three years. Yeah. 
Okay. So not unanimous, correct? Mr. Chair, are we just trying to give Ben consensus? The purpose of this is to give them input mm -hmm. so they'll know the strength of our recommendation. It's, it's to know whether we have a majority of the board uh, or a unanimous board. Gotcha. Thank you. And in some cases, maybe a non majority. We'll but I think it. if and you had it. eight or nine in favor, we could generally say that was consensus, right? Consensus. Yes, absolutely. Okay, thank you. It's mainly wording for Dean and myself when we talk across the street. And this is not uncommon. This we, we actually went through this process when I was legislative liaison. Uh, only they're more active than I was. On the next point, the goal of moving toward providing the first 15 post-secondary credit hours tuition-free during high school. Questions? Yep. Mr. Morowski. Okay, thank you, Ben. Uh, uh, so on that... I, I like that opportunity. Uh, whether, but I, what I what I what I would want to see happen with that is kind of like if you're going to get a scholarship for running or something like that, you have to earn that. So you have to either score points for the team, meaning you have to be fully engaged in that those 15 hours. With a, it has to either be a GPA requirement of some sort maintained throughout that, or a competency test. So if you're like we paid so much money, I guess four hundred and some dollars for an AP test. If he didn't do well on that, out goes the four hundred and some dollars. But but it all fell under COVID, so it was like there there was it was kind of a bad situation and bad timing on that. I wouldn't have even signed him up for that. So I'm just thinking as far as I was talking about my son. So I'm thinking it needs to be either a competency or a, at a certain level, in my opinion, if we're going to have taxpayer funding for that, because if you're going to college and you're paying for that. You're going to be you're going to be engaged in probably, and I don't think this is mandating taking those 15 hours at all. So I think this statement is saying students should have the opportunity to get 15 credit hours at no cost to them. How you arrive at that may not even be additional money. It could be a transference of money between. It may be additional money. It may be a different look at it. So the details you mentioned, Michelle. Sir, could certainly be a part of. That's what I'd like to see. Yeah. I, I, before I just say, yeah, that sounds great. I, I want to yeah. see the details. I, I want to see the yeah, details I, of that. Yeah, but is it something that you want to promote that students should have that opportunity? And then you'd have to list the qualifications yes. for all that. Absolutely. Mm -hmm. yep. Yep. And the qualifications would be the details in the actual legislation that implements it. So. Or, and or, an agreement between the Board of Regents and us and, and the on how to look schools. at K-12 funding and higher ed funding a little bit different. So you've got that as a legislative priority possibly, and you've got that as a priority between you and the Board of Regents. All right. So I think what you're saying is we've got to figure out a way to get 15 credits available to families at no cost to them, and there's a lot of details that have to be worked out around. Well, and some may not be aware, we actually had a proposal for this that we got through the Senate. It just failed in the House because they weren't up to speed on it. So we had a deal worked out with the Board of Regents and Community Colleges to make this happen about three years ago. And the thing was, you had to be qualified to go to college. You had to have an ACT score, and um, a GPA, and then you were eligible, just like any other kid going to college. So um, anyway, but we had it done at one time, so we need to revive that again. And, and actually, colleges won't accept you unless you have those kinds of, of uh, qualifications. So... I think it's already already handled in a lot of ways. So is everybody in agreement yes, on and that? We're not in any way asking uh, colleges to change their admission requirements. Mm -hmm. no. no. Are we all on board with moving toward that goal? Okay. And Betty, you are too. So. so. Um. Extending special education learning services to age 22 for one year to accommodate learning loss because of COVID. 
this came as a request from SEAC, which Bert kind of laid out some of the issues that they had. I've had a number of, uh, of parents contact me that have students that were that were aging out of the system mm -hmm. that did in fact uh, lose services uh, during this last year. Yeah, I think this, is and it's for those kids in transition. Are we all in agreement on on that one? Okay. And schools can use their COVID funds to, to yes. fund this. Mm -hmm. They, they will have the money. Yep. Uh, on the uh, age 22, next bullet point. Good. Yep. Okay. Okay. On social and emotional issues, first bullet point the ongoing work of the mental, school mental health advisory council, including but not limited bullying prevention efforts for suicide prevention and awareness, child, blue, uh, child abuse, and neglect. It's essentially supporting the work of the mental health, school mental health task force is what it is. But I have a question as to why that's a legislative priority when it's our committee. I mean, we don't need their permission to do this or money to fund it. So why is it on here? It's, it's kind of like academics. Academics isn't yeah. on here because we work on it all the time. You know, it's just a priority. I think it's... Because the school, because the legislature has taken it upon themselves to have legislation <coughs> proposed for bullying and for suicide prevention and so on. In a sense, it's telling them we're working with, it, working on it. So, is is this? An internal one, or is this a legislatively set? Because there are legislative seats on this. It's our committee. It we is our committee. I completely. think there's legislative. Yeah. I think there are. Okay. I couldn't remember if this was one of the task force. It extends beyond my service time, so. This appears to me to be preemptive. We're saying mm -hmm. let the let, let the mental when these issues come up, let's use the mental health advisory council as opposed mm -hmm. to individual laws to deal with. Uh, yeah. to do, we want to deal, yeah, it doesn't predate me. <laughs> we want to deal with the issues like child abuse, uh, the Aaron's Law, uh, Jason Flat Act, all those sorts of things. They are mental health issues and we want to deal with them comprehensively instead of piecemeal. Mm -hmm. And that I think is what it's saying. Yeah. I mean that, that was, when this was put on the legislative priorities, Originally, that was the reason that it was done. Yeah, that we may want to revisit. This is kind of a carryover from last well, I just thought the language could be a little bit stronger. If It's kind of like the ones we had on the back with policy governance. We support our constitutional authority to do this, and it's the same way with uh, social-emotional issues, which were all attempts of them to provide curriculum we didn't need. may be interpreted as, well, that's just not part of their agenda. Well, and I think it lets, lets the legislature know we are, that is something we're working toward the solutions for. Are we, are we good to go on that line item in general agreement? Can you add, go back to Ann for a second? She's saying it, it does not require funding from the legislature? No, it's a committee we formed to do work for us and make and give us advice. Well, I stand in agreement with you if, if it's not requesting funding. Well, I, I'm just, I'm, I like the idea of letting, you know, the preemptive strike, you know, this is our area, but maybe it could say more strongly, this is our area, but I'm good either way. I, 
think it's for preemptive reasons. I think it's important to say it. Mm. And I can live with stronger language, or I can live with it as it is. Everybody supports the items. Uh, expansion of the mental health intervention pilot, which Craig just talked about a little bit ago. That does cost money. And it began with the legislature. Yeah, it began with them anyway. Mm -hmm. This is another one you may at least, you may want to have some discussion around the, the millions of dollars that school districts are pouring in with ESSER funds currently, and then capacity of both systems to accommodate people coming into that system, whether it's a collaboration or the, uh, uh, the ability of any school system to handle any more outside of the money that they're putting in with ESSER 2 and then soon to be ESSER 3. And Craig, I don't know if you want to comment on that, but if you're going to be asking for more money on the school mental health, it, what, you may not get school districts that crazy about doing it because they've got to spend the ESSER money before they get to 24. So, so I, I'm just, it, it may be a capacity issue, may. It, it is a capacity issue and the existence of the ESSER funds so that school districts can hire more personnel has created a little bit of a tension with community mental health centers because there's a limited number of people out there that are licensed to serve in those positions. So as a school district, when you open a, a, a vacancy, who applies? Well, in some cases, it's employees at the community mental health center. So we may not be increasing the capacity in some cases. We may be just trading who has that capacity available. <laughs> Board's wishes or any more thoughts? Are we in agreement with that? Okay. Uh, health and safety issues, passes of Tobacco 21 legislation plus bans on flavoring for electronic nicotine. Oh, we good? Okay. Legislative recommendations of the school bus stop arm violation committee without a diatribe from Mr. Porter. <laughs> we good, yeah. I'm in total agreement with you by the way, Mr. Chair. But I know you like that topic a lot. Uh, the efforts of the Attorney General to reduce human trafficking in Kansas. Efforts to reduce the opioid academic in Kansas. Uh, school vision, updating school vision screening statute, which is a request from School for the Blind. And then the ongoing work of the Juvenile Justice Oversight Committee. Okay. Uh, funding issues. Uh, supporting the recommended funding levels approved by the Kansas Supreme Court and is appreciative of the legislators' efforts to, to date to meet that agreement. That's the base state aid. That sort of work. It's more than base state aid. Mm -hmm. And the formula. We in agreement on that one? Okay. Uh, education public funds being provided to only public schools. Are we in agreement on that one? Okay. Following state statute and moving toward funding 92% of the excess cost of special education, and this falls in line with our budget recommendation uh, that we made over five years. Continued coordination and investment in career and technical education programs that are aligned to workforce needs. of opportunities to expand early childhood and kindergarten readiness. Okay. Expansion of the transportation funding formula to include students living between one and 2.5 miles of their attendance center with a one year suspension of the cap on transportation waitings. Mm-hmm. 
Mike, please. Thank you. There's a uh, certainly a, a difference that was built upon a rural basis uh, originally, and, and urban and suburban areas have unique challenges that are not defined by distance, but by circumstances of traffic, traffic ways, um, accessibility that place students in jeopardy, especially younger ones. You know, um, so any assistance that we could provide uh, that would uh, help with the busing transportation for all students in Kansas. But we need to reevaluate that. We're probably not going to get a, a, a change in funding until we have a study or some kind of statement. But I think we ought to be looking at reevaluating our uh, formula for, uh, uh, for busing uh, reimbursement. Yeah, some districts do a good job with it. Some just yeah. don't. They just this. This is the rule, and we're doing it this yeah. way. And others pick up everybody at their own expense. And you know, so, the, the world has changed since the 1960s. I thought. And this is one of those examples. We live in a very uh, geographically a very diverse state when it comes to size of schools and you know urban, rural, suburban, and it's. To, to reinforce what Jim said, it's certainly difficult to make a one-size-fits-all uh, because you can live across the street from a school in, in an urban area and it's dangerous to get there, uh, which is a different problem entirely. Uh, I'm living two and a half miles down a dirt road. Mm -hmm. But we have kids in both positions in the state. So, Mr. McNeese, is it in agreement of the direction it's going, or would you rather see more and then just have a consensus? I, I, on our consensus for us today? On that item, yes. On that item? I might think about changing the, uh, the, the item itself. Okay. To, and, and I don't want to take away from it, yeah. but uh, that we should reevaluate as... Chairman Porter said, uh, the law that exists right now and look for uh, accommodations to, to improve the safety of all students in their transportation to school. Okay. Um, I hate to agree publicly with the other Jim, but that makes sense, you know, that we need to, thank you. We need to look at, uh, we need to look at ways to, we need to look at the law and find ways to improve the safety of all students. Okay. Is that what you're saying, isn't it, Jim? Yes. It shouldn't just be about funding. It should be about, you know, safety and how funding can improve the safety of students uh, being transported from home to school. Is the desire, would the desire of the board be to, to change the language to that point or to keep the language as it is? May or, I jump in? Yeah, you certainly may. Okay. Because one of the things that even if it doesn't um, change anything, and even though we may have to look at other areas, I think it's just nice to have that on there indicating this is something that even if it takes more study that we are looking at and we are interested in. Uh, transportation has been a topic that's that's been discussed for some time with very little action. I just think it's, it may, I don't disagree with what Jim is saying, but I do think it's just indicating this is an area of concern, just as some of the other things that we put on there are. Can we make a recommendation that this should be an issue that is studied you know, and I hate to say study because they just lose it sometimes and study, but uh, that should be addressed. Um, and we would want to be a part of that with, in collaboration with the legislature. Another reason to maybe redo this in that area is this is one of the things that came up in our meeting with the legislature. Mm -hmm. 
and to talk about cooperative ways to find better ways, safer ways to get students to and from school. Uh, first of all, is accommodation to that statement. And it serves the same purpose of saying, let's figure out ways to do this. That right now we believe that the two and a half mile limit, you know, we don't have to say that. Uh, the current the current situation is dangerous or pro provides dangerous situations for students both in rural and urban and suburban areas uh, and we would like to have that entire process reevaluated and we're glad to be partners in the reevaluation we'll turn it over to Craig issue. It's supposed to be on, so. Our three mics work. <laughs> because, because that is larger, that's a larger issue, and, and, and it's also very student-focused. Uh, I kind of like keeping them both on there because they're different statutes and different issues involved. Um, That's a good point. So one of them, for example, is going to require a lot of money to fund, and the other one pays for itself with the fine things. So I don't want to get them tied together. I don't mind if we reward this one, but I'd like to leave them both out there as separate items we're interested in. Maybe one could pay for the other. <laughs> <laughs> I could. If well, if if we change the desire of this, I would recommend that we move this bullet point to the other section where it would be health and safety issues since we're not exactly recommending funding with this line item anymore. Mm -hmm. Even though it can be part of the solution, it may not be the total solution and we're not expressly uh, asking for money uh, with that. With that, and this is very rough, and I'm that's what I was working on was some wording, but it would be under health and safety supports the following, establishing a committee to study the improvement uh, of school transportation safety. I think and you need to tell them what we're thinking what? about. Yeah. <clears throat> and I I'm thought. I'm not a wordsmith. <laughs> on the fly. We could include exactly where it's located mm -hmm and just talk about there needs to be a reevaluation of our transportation plan to guarantee the safety of all students. For example, and then use what we already have there. And I think that gets kind of the idea that more things could uh, take place than what we're talking about, but more changes, in other words. I guess my only thing is to be clear that for voting, we know what the wording is, because the wording is important. So as long as I have that in wording, do I, I need? Think we can, uh, if we're given the, the ability to work with Craig on the language, since it's kind of his bailiwick, and uh, then I think he's heard the discussion, so he can assist us. I would like to keep the stop arm separate, and you know I, I won't I go. Too. I won't go on on my tirade mm -hmm. about that, uh, but I would like to keep that separate because there's been a specific bill that is funded that has been presented every year. Uh, but m may I suggest for moving ahead that we uh, that we look at it when we when we vote on this today that particular item we will not vote on, and give 
those of you that are working on that the opportunity overnight mm -hmm. uh, to come back with a with a yep. uh, plan that can be added tomorrow. Yep. And that works. That's fine. With That's fine. So I'm running Esther through my, my head, and I'm going to look at Craig. I don't believe many school districts have used this with their Esther 1 and 2, but most districts tell me they have a shortage of bus drivers. It's really, really hard to find them, keep them. You can use ESSER funds to pay parents to transport kids. But you can also do that outside of two and a half miles, which Great Bend does. I'm not sure if anyone else does. I just, there is a short-term solution possibly if you have a shortage created by COVID of bus drivers and that relates to the safety as you think about possible solutions. few that have done it so that they don't have to combine routes and they can leave students more socially spaced on the buses. That's the rationale that allows them to use COVID funds. Well, and every time we discuss this, since I've been on the board, it was, a, we, you know, we discuss whether or not we want to do the, go to two miles or go to a mile and a half, you know, make a recommendations that way. That was institutional thinking we've always done it that way so we're going to continue to do that this is a change what we're asking for is a change in the process uh, and I think that that is uh, out of the box thinking that needs that 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 we need to do a lot more of okay so we will bring back at a, a new new item point tomorrow amending the capital state and yeah Amending the capital improvement state aid formula by removing USD 207, Fort Leavenworth, thereby providing more equitable funding for capital improvement projects. And Fort Leavenworth has, what, two taxable properties on it? Uh, actually, Crown Rapids is about four. Oh, there's four? Oh, they've doubled. Um, but um, it's it, most of it sits on a military base, and they can't run, but our state aid is based off of that district uh, with that in the formula. Um, and what's the gap between the lowest and the next lowest? It's about 30%. Yeah. Close. So Fort Leavenworth's assessed valuation per pupil uh, is literally $1,000. The next lowest, uh, I believe, is 26000 But maybe more important to the issue of tying bond election state aid to Fort Leavenworth, by law they cannot have a bond election at Fort Leavenworth. So it doesn't even apply to them. Are we in agreement on that one? Okay. Meeting student needs. Uh, State Board supports the following. The concept of public-private partnerships with business and industry, and industry, et cetera, to allow for internships, mentoring, et cetera. Mm -hmm. Going down to, skipping all the way down to local school board authority, the Kansas State Board of Education supports authority of local school boards. That would, uh, in my opinion, fall under local, local, like if the Blue Valley wants to work with a local shop or whatever mm -hmm. it is, um, because they, they would have to work out who's paying for that, in my opinion. So I, I, I'd say that falls. We, we support local, local schools to, to do that. Is that what we're saying? It's under their authority to do the detail work as to what businesses they stuff this uh, uh, and that stuff. But with our board goals about getting kids in the workplace and, and the work-based learning, that this is this is saying this is an important thing for the state board to to extenuate. And we talk about it all the time with CTE. I know when Stacy's down here, we talk about uh, placing those. And so it's reiterating that point that we believe it's a it's, a, it's an important concept. So if a, so if a student owns his own business and, and wants to use it and leave part of the day and go and work on his business, he could be getting school hours for that is that correct that would be local yeah mm -hmm. okay yeah, th this okay. issue also has a liability insurance component to it that's and that's the next point a, yeah yeah so this is encouraging those from our position and state that we encourage those those relationships to the legislature uh so they don't because it's something that they also i think have agreed to in the past and it's reiterating their points are we in agreement on that one Finding a solution to liability issues for workplace learning opportunities for students, which those two go hand in hand. In agreement with that one? Okay. 
The legislation which requires that the State Board of Education legislature work together to monitor the success of the foster child report card. In agreement with that one? Okay. On education policy governments, supports the constitutional authority given to the State Board of Education to determine statewide uh, curricular standards and to determine, wording changed in that one, standard and to determine all high school graduation course requirements. Authority given to but not limited. That should have been added in there. Or did that get taken out? Determined, not limited to, after determined. Should we add accreditation and licensure to that? Uh, licensure is down there. Okay. I, I yeah. caution you from making it look like you're giving a list of what your authority is. Two's up in the first in the first. first section, and we kind of broke this one apart mm -hmm. with the exception of putting in graduation course requirements and standards. It wasn't. Oh, it, it was the preamble. That's what I was thinking. It was Peggy. And it's still there. Mm -hmm. That's where my mind went. So just cut everything after the word education. Mm -hmm. Are we in agreement with that change? Yeah, that makes sense. I, it, it does not I didn't give them a list. Everything. It's striking everything after the word education. So it would just read the constitutional authority given to the State Board of Education. Period. I think this was a focus to make certain that. Uh, curricular standards and a focus on high school graduation course requirements that have been kind of a, an issue. I think that's the reason there, that it's there. Well, it was, Dean, but it kind of goes to one time we had a list of things after under local school board authority, like curriculum and blah, 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 blah. And then we thought, like Randy said, if you start making a list, and you leave off somebody, you know, or something, then they'll think, oh, they don't care about that one. Well, I'm just saying the reason it was added there. Well, we'll let you two remind them of it every so chance you if, get. If you want to direct <laughs> I do, to drop me. it, it'll be dropped, but I'm just telling you the reason it was added. Mm -hmm. Yeah, I understand the reason it was there. You know, accreditation is off this list. That doesn't mean that it's not listed there. That, that doesn't mean that that's not important. I'm, a, mm -hmm. you know, I hadn't even thought of that. And so Randy mentioned it, but if we give them a list, uh, we may be saying this is the only thing we're interested in. And mm -hmm. the fact is, we are interested in that plus other things. Mm -hmm. So, I sort of like the idea of putting the period after education, even though I understand what Dean is saying, mm -hmm. because those have been specific issues that they've tried to do. I don't. I don't want to give them a list. So we'll just put a period after education. I think we're all in agreement with that, and then in agreement with that. It's a two-pronged question, and then agreement with that statement. So we can move on. Okay. The governance responsibilities assigned to the Kansas State High School Activities Association. In agreement with that. And the responsibility of Kansas State Board. Uh, since we kind of did that, what about striking that one, Mr. Chair? For the same rationale that we put the period after education, I think that that probably should not be there. Yep. 
going to say, do we need to drop the, the last one? Mm -hmm. Because the same argument could be made. Mm -hmm. With the Activities Association, that we support that, should we also put local boards of education? It's, it's, it's down it, there. It's already it, okay, I didn't see on that. Yep. Sorry. It's on there. Um, then moving on, so we're going to strike that last bullet point. On disaster issues, we're supportive of adjusting statutes to include more flexibility when responding to natural disasters, including the current pandemic, as it relates to required hours under days of instruction. Yay. In general agreement. Well, just to put all those groups together, should we move local school board that bullet point up under education policy governance? Us, them, and Keisha, all under one. Here's who rules the roost on these, we think. Mm -hmm. We could. It's not state level like the other ones are, but I guess the point why it was separated out is because it was a, it's a, it accentuates the point a little bit stronger with having its own area. So combine it under one heading. Okay. Mm -hmm. Yeah. It's your guys' document, so. <laughs> I know. <laughs> yeah, it's just putting it. Uh, yeah. So are we in agreement with moving that last, well, on the disaster issues, because that is the next bullet point? And then going to local board, just so we're clear as to what we're talking about. On the disaster issues, are we all in agreement with the disaster issues? Okay. Then on local board authority, moving that bullet point up to under education policy governance. Are we in agreement on that one? Okay. And then the conclusion is there. That would have been new. Any further discussion? Okay, thank you, Mr. Chair. Well, we're not through. Motion would be in order to approve the uh, legislative priorities as they have been discussed and amended uh, with the exception of the one that's coming back tomorrow. Jim McNeese makes that motion. Is there a second? M Melanie seconds that motion. Any further discussion? All in favor, please raise your hand. All opposed? That appears to me to be unanimous. Thank you. I was concerned after our meeting that didn't go as well as I had anticipated. Uh, and I've had several changes in attitude since that meeting. Uh, sometimes with time, uh, more common sense prevails. Uh, and so instead of, if we'd had this discussion the day after, it'd be different from the discussion today. I believe that our attempt to meet with the legislatures and build relationships and to find ways to co collaborate and coordinate was not successful. So how do we move, I wanna have a discussion about how we move forward from this point to try to, uh, to con I mean, they still are there and we're still here and we need to find ways to, and I don't know what I'm doing, so you just go ahead. <laughs> well, you know, when they come in and they start the meeting off with an attack on something 
and threats, literally, on something that's not even on our list of things to do, you know they didn't come here with the intent to get along. But having said that, um, three of them did and three of them didn't. And I don't think the chairman, those three chairmen's um, attitude toward us is representative of the entire legislature. I think most of the legislature is very pro-public education. They're very good to talk to, and they're open to what we have to say. So while we do have to deal with the chairs, and we'll do that as best we can and show up for every committee meeting and fight the half-truths that you know and outright lies that are going to be presented, like we heard some from the chief of misinformation today, um, we're going to have to combat that in open committee. I think we have a lot of room to work with the other legislators to bring them around to uh, our thoughts. And, and, has, and having been someone that's been there, what's the best way to do that? Well, we, I mean, there are a lot of ways to do it. I mean, these one-on-one -on -one meetings, um, issue by issue, what you guys did with the postcards, you know, in terms of trying to get information out quickly to all of them and then follow up with phone calls to key people. But it's a lot of one-on-one -on -one contact, really. And it starts now, not in January. I mean, we all have legislators. Maybe we just need to, uh, and some of them overlap, but kind of assign each of us somebody. And it wouldn't even have to be in your own district. I mean, I have a lot of legislators outside my district that, you know, find out who has the best connection and then use those connections. One of the things that irritated me the most was the statement when we were talking about community colleges, behind closed doors. Yeah, that was, uh, you know. That is an absolutely false statement. Well, and the notion that because we didn't list academic achievement on our list of legislative priorities, it's not a priority. Yes, it, we, we know it's a priority. We just don't have the need to go over there and ask their permission to work on it. We work on it all the time. And reading, I mean, you know, Hello, we just put 15 million into it. So there's not even an awareness of what we're actually doing on the, in the part of leadership. So we have to combat those misunderstandings up front and loudly. But behind the scenes, we need to be making connections now, I think, with other legislators who we can talk to about key issues, and not 21 issues, you know, but three or four issues we know are going to come up and have our talking points ready and go talk to them now. Okay, on that subject about not 21 issues, but four or five, uh, let me throw something out. I'm thinking out of the top of my head now. I'm, you know, whenever, the, the, we all went to the, uh, to one of the meetings that Randy and Brad had somewhere. And he had that process, that Minty process. Perhaps, we could look at those 21 issues next and, and, and determine which ones are the most important to us. And Randy could set up, if he's willing, set up a system where we could actually vote that way and determine, you know, some of these may be, uh, every one of us may think is the top one. Uh, and because it, it, it is important. Well, not, it might, not might, to dilute our message. Might not even be our priority, but if their priority is to defund us, then that has to be our something we have to start combating now, if that makes sense. I mean, what they're going to talk about maybe November 30th and December 1st will give us a real good clue of what we need to be talking to people about to combat. I mean, we already know CRTs on the list, okay? Even though that, that's not a legislative priority, how do we miss that? Um, you know, we're, we know we're going to have to combat it. Does that make sense? Yes, and how do we do that? Tell the truth. I mean, we already know what their list of lies looks like. We got handed it to us today. I would bet that if you ask 20 people what CRT was, you get 20 different answers. 
and none of them would be right. Well, I want us to continue to have this discussion because, I, quite frankly, I'm at a loss as to how to do that. But to build relationships with individual legislators that may not be in the leadership, uh, I want to go back and remind you, you know, I'm, I'm going to go back to the issue of behind closed doors because I want to remind everybody what happened there. We discussed that when we met with the Board of Regents. It was an open meeting that everybody heard. That was the first time it was discussed in public. The person that is in charge of the group uh, that uh, supports community colleges, they have, they have an organization it's like, I don't know exactly what it is, but they have a, an organization, community college. Janet Wah and I went, I mean, that was the last thing we discussed. And then Janet Law and I went to lunch that day, and that person caught us at lunch and wanted to talk about that. The only way she could have heard it is not behind a closed-door meeting, but at that meeting. Janet came, we both came back to Topeka and had a meeting with her. Now, the chair and vice chair of the Board of Regents and Janet and I had a meeting uh, with the four of us and Blake and Randy for the purpose of discussing what information we needed. Not We didn't make any decisions. We determined what information we would need to present to both the State Board of Education and the Board of Regents uh, about, uh, about how to proceed. I reported that meeting to you in open session the next time we met. And the chair of the Board of Regents reported that meeting to the Board of Regents the next time they met. There have been no closed-door meetings that have not been presented to the various boards. And that was, an, that was an insult to us and a blatant misstatement. And you might tell that I'm a little irritated by that. Uh, and the issue is that we that it was brought to our attention by school districts that are having trouble finding quality programs for their students. And we would like the Board of Regents, we, we know that we have zero authority to deal with that. We would like the Board of Regents to address that issue. How they do it is up to them. If they do it, it's up to them. But that was listed as one of our priorities, and we're and, unless uh, unless you tell us otherwise, we're going to continue to ask that question because there are places where where community colleges do an excellent job of providing quality programs to the people in their area. As I I don't I don't know this as a fact, but I would. Um, I'm guessing, and I and I and I feel pretty confident this, that most community colleges provide quality education, quality programs. But there are those that were that are not as quality, and there is no incentive uh, to do any better if they can say, "Well, okay, you have to come here because this is our territory." We would like for that to be addressed. If I were doing it, and I'm not, if I were in charge of the Board of Regents. In that case, I would bring the presidents together and say, this is a problem, tell me how to figure it out, and let them figure it out. Uh, but, uh, and well, I won't even presume, I guess I have suggested it now because this is a public meeting. Uh, but, uh, you know, those, those are the ways that we solve that problem. We can't because of, and Ann put this, because of intimidation and threats not issue, not support the problems that the people that that are in public school districts trying to provide quality programs tell us are problems, we can't just ignore it because of those other things. So that's the position that I have on that particular issue. Uh, so now I'll get off my high horse and go back to trying to be common sense uh, and uh, and and support what Ann said about the fact that we need to 
to build relationships with all legislators. And it's going to be something that we need to do individually. Every one of us know people. Uh, and every one of us have relationships with people. And like Ann, I have relationships with legislators that are not in my district. Uh, and, uh, and so we need to identify, probably at some point, we need to identify who each one of us knows and who each one of us has relationships with and try to cultivate those relationships, not to, not to do anything except to make sure that they are aware. Uh, they've got a lot of things on their plate. Uh, so that so that they are aware of what we're doing, uh, you know. Uh, there was a legislator that, you know, when, when things come up, and, and and those of us that were at the meeting the other, the, the one in in in, uh, in in Oakland Park last Saturday, you know, uh, it's obvious that. Uh, that they that, that they had a lot of questions about the authority of us or the authority of the local boards of education. Uh, good people don't understand some things, and what they re what really is not understood is that there are six of us in the United States that have self-regulating authority. So whenever somebody comes to say, "You need to pass this really good law because it's happened in 30 states." Uh, that's because in those 30 states, the only way that could have happened was through the legislative process and in Kansas and in Utah and in Colorado and in about three other states, Nebraska. Uh, that's not the way it's done. Uh, and so we need, to, uh, we need to better educate people on that. Any other comments about how to move forward? I would um, think that it would be worthwhile continuing with this process, um, regardless of how you might feel right now about it. Um, I think it's important to, to continue to make that effort, to continue to show that we're willing to listen, to get feedback, to present ideas to them, um, I think not only is there a relationship that we'll build, I mean, this is one step, really, a very small one, um, but if we continue to offer meetings and, and that type of thing, eventually I think that will build into somewhat more positive relationship. And it also is a, is a really good example to other people that we are open to receiving information from them, to receiving feedback on how uh, their, the public's perception, because they do represent the voters of Kansas. So I would hope that we would be able to continue this on some sort of regular basis. Yes, go ahead. That's working. Is it really? I can't hear myself. Oh, good. Um, <clears throat> First of all, uh, thank you for your comments. There's a frustration that we've had for a long time. But, you know, they're frustrated too. Because when they're addressed by us with a tone of, you know, you guys just don't listen. You know, well, they don't think we listen to them either. I remember those comments. You know, um, if the relationship is going to change, it's probably going to change because we change, not because they change at the same time. Um, we want this to change because we know it will serve the, the school districts and the, and the children of our, the students of our, our districts as a result of our behaviors. And I don't want to be demeaning, but um, we need to be the adult in the room. Well, I'm going to go back to some of the things we did in past times. Maybe we go out, go out and do the, the, the uh, postcards again. Maybe we uh, target people that, that each one of us has a named person that they, between board meetings, have to contact. You know, put a plan together that is um, 
identifies the responsibilities of each of us, and then we can decide whether we want to accept that responsibility or not, you know, and move forward. Um, you know, so I'm going to uh, look at Melanie and say, Melanie, the communications team has to get going again. So after this meeting, we'll get together and see if we can even bring something back to you tomorrow, you know, or later uh, on doing them. Uh, I do know from past experience over the years, and we all know this, we've been here a while, that right now is the time to talk to the legislators. They're more open, they're more available, uh, and they're more amenable. You know, so now is the time to really talk to them. In January, they're busy. They're running around, you know, and I can understand they're being inundated by all kinds of people and folks with agendas. So, and I'm sure they are right now as well, but they're more hospitable. I know I've got a couple of meetings set up for this week, and uh, just to just to talk and and quite frankly, um, to get uh, uh, their their phone number that gets to them. <laughs> you know, it's little things like that, and then be helpful, because I remember I know it wasn't a very good meeting the other last time, um, but it, you got to look at two things I think. One is they came here. That was an historic move, but in coming here, the second part is. They came here to tell us we're in charge, and that probably graded us to some degree. But I can understand that, you know. Um, I don't particularly appreciate it all the time, but I know that some of the people who did that, they're pretty much been supportive, some of them, for us, you know. And I don't want to alienate them, you know, but I do appreciate that they came, you know. But doing some new things, thinking about some new ways of, of communicating and, and developing relationships. Uh, as we move into this next legislative session, uh, could be some of the things we've done in the past but haven't done recently, and could be some new things that we need to focus on. But the most important thing we can do is each one of you make sure that you're talking to at least one or two, three people between now and Christmas. This is the time. you know. And you are, by the way, a voter and a citizen and a representative of an area that they have. And not that I was wanted to be mean about something, but one of them told me one time that he represented, you know, 1,700 people. I'd elected him. I told him, well, 93 people, 93,000 people voted for me. <laughs> we do represent a large swath, more than any other elected official other than the, the state folks. And we need to think about that, you know. But it doesn't work for us if we don't communicate with those people as well. And we need to be good representatives. So I kind of droned on a little longer, but uh, uh, this is a great conversation. Um, but I want, really want to come out of this, this in a positive way um, that we step forward uh, with the legislators because the Constitution is designed that we have to work together. We can't work separately. Thank you. And we have had an offer by the Kansas Leadership Center to uh, facilitate any discussion, so we may want to... We may, we may we may want to at least consider that, uh, but cons and but, uh, but that that sort of conversation that sort of facilitated conversation, both both people both groups have to agree to certain uh, to, to to certain uh, basic rules. Dina, I just wanted to mention. Um, some time that we were visiting about having this conversation. Uh, we talked about elephants in our room. Well, I think we heard what the elephants are in their room. And sometimes you clear the air and then you can really talk. So I agree with what Jean said. We need to keep working at it and uh, look at it as more of a positive move than a negative one. Well, as Jim said, they did come. They, they in fact, did come. Betty, I see you. <laughs> okay. One of the things that, that concerns me, and even though they brought some issues, we never really 
uh, responded to those issues. I mean, whether they were valid or not, we didn't offer a response. I had thought just from a positive step um, to set up something where these are your concerns, let us in public respond to those concerns, let us answer those questions that you are, that you have brought forth, even though that wasn't on the agenda. And, and I'm saying that because sometimes, and this was the concern that I heard was, okay, if that wasn't the case and you said nothing, it makes it appear as though what they're saying is valid. Um, so yes, we need to build a positive relationship, but we also need to maintain the public confidence that we are doing what we are elected to do. And I just think it would be nice to, um, these are the concerns that you that were brought up. We would like to address those concerns, close that chapter, and then move on. It, it just seems like that would be a positive way of handling it, talking directly with them instead of after the fact. And I'll mute. Once again, I believe everybody in the room has proven themselves to be more mature than me. <laughs> Thank you. Well, we can go ahead, Miss. Thank you, Chairman Porter. So just to address um, some of the topics that were brought up at the Open Citizens Forum today, um, you know, I'm just looking at a lot of these are in my district and um, uh, in District 3, and they, and they did happen. I mean, they were in my, my school, high school and, and middle school. So, and I have, uh, I have a copy of the training manual. So I have it in my hand, I mean, I have it in my possession. So they, these things did happen. So we need to at least respond and say, these are again, local issues. And we, we addressed it at the, at the building level. And, um, and, and, and I, th I feel like things have gotten better. So we just need to remind them that we, we agree that yes, maybe these things happen. This isn't a, necessarily, I don't think this is a state board issue or a state issue, it's a local issue. And, and they can be handled, and, and, and some of them were handled in the last election. I mean, they, they, some things were switched completely. So the, the, they were able to, to vote, the community voted uh, in response to some of these things that happened. So um, I, I'm not going to get into the, I'm not going to get into the assessments and things because some districts are doing really well even coming out of COVID. And we, maybe we need to highlight those. There's a lot of good things happening out there and there's a lot of good communication going on between um, their local board members and their teachers, and then it's getting back to the parents and, and ways of inter, um, intervention. And those things are happening in my in my district as well. So I just think that we need to address it. Yes, we understand some of these things are happening as far as labeling critical race theory and all that. It, it's things that were disturbing to parents and, um, and some of those issues have been taken care of and resolved. So I just wanna make sure that we're staying ahead of it, being transparent, it ne not necessarily is it happening in Ben's district or Jean's district? But it, a lot of these are right in my district. It's a big area. It's very populated, big schools. Um, not might not be happening in every building, but it was happening in a couple of buildings uh, right in my own backyard here. So we just want to make sure that we know that these things are being handled, and, and they hopefully are at the local level as they should be. And and um, I just want to I just want to make those points that that the. They just we just need to stay ahead of it and be transparent about it, and it might some of it might be misinformation, but the actual that's why I said make sure you give me examples. If you're sending me anything, don't just blatantly say this is happening all across Kansas because it may only be happening in one or two buildings. But we need to address it as it comes up locally. Make sure that they're addressing it with their parents. Thank you. Okay, thank you. Ann, uh, did you have your hand up, Jean? Yes. Ann, Jean, and. Okay, yeah. thank you. Well, I agree with Michelle, the right place to handle these things is at the local level. The problem is they labeled all these things CRT and they're not CRT. None of them are CRT. And that's the problem we're gonna have. You're gonna have these same folks who are here and others going to the legislature going, oh my God, we gotta stop CRT. No, we're not teaching CRT. You may not like how they handled your diversity training. You may not like how they what they do with equity you may not like that video they showed but 
that's not CRT. It's an issue you need to deal with locally. We're glad to have them do that. But the problem we're going to have is how we deal with all this mislabeling they're going to do. They're going to bring the same list in and go, oh, they're doing CRT. And we're going to go, nah, it's not CRT. And how do we talk to people about that's the, the thing? How do we, I don't know. It's going to be a tough one, but we got to figure it out because we're going to have to talk to them about it. So. that we should respond to some of the brought up and whether that is verbally at the time or maybe in a memo back to the people who attended or something I think it would be helpful because that um, sort of completes the circle of the communication so on that subject one of the people that the, the well, I, I contacted the issue, the, the, the issue about the community college. I contacted that person and indicated that I, we were going to have this discussion today. And this had been a couple of weeks ago. That we were going to have that discussion today. And I would appreciate her perspective. So we would have that perspective when we had this discussion. I never got a response. Last night, after I got back to the room, I again indicated that I was disappointed that I didn't get a response and addressed the issue of uh, community colleges and open meeting, <coughs> those particular things. So that that has happened, and of course, I haven't looked at my where that I got a response today, uh, but uh, but it, I did that. But that's all I've done. Janet. Thank you, Mr. Chair. Uh, oh, man. All of you don't know this, but the day after this, I called Jim and I blew up. Because <laughs> I was very upset about what happened. I was just furious. I wanted us to immediately put a press release out and all that. Well, he calmed me down and said, calm down and I did <laughs> so anyway I've thought about it a long time and I was very I think what I was upset about most is 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 I felt these were total untruths everything that they were saying you know that just blew my mind that these were absolute untruths I mean you know and how could they say that and blah 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 we needed to respond I agree Betty we need to respond uh, but I don't know. I think the most important thing we can do, and I think we're doing it right now, is maybe bringing this all out in the open. Like the, the comment about how we didn't care about kids receiving an education. All we wanted was them to have the social-emotional piece. Now, that's not true. You know, I don't know for, of one board member that I've ever worked with locally or on the state board who did not put education as an absolute top priority. We may have had different ways to get at it, but nevertheless, we all believe that was absolute. But we're doing what the state asked us to do on the social emotional piece. We didn't, the state told us to do this. So that was very hurtful, you know. So, however, <laughs> As everyone said, they do represent all other people, and I think we do need to work with them and uh, try to, well, probably maybe never convince them, but let them know how sincere we are in what we're trying to do. We're trying to make Kansas great at education, and uh, I think we should continue on. How we go about it, I don't know, but uh, I, was, I was extremely disappointed in that. You know, I was sitting here thinking about everything that happened. When I first started serving on my local board many, many, many years ago, I went to KASB and I went to several meetings. And one of the first things they told me, which I really, it stuck with me all these years, is you must agree to disagree. And I think that's what we all have to do. We have to agree to disagree. And then we have to disagree agreeably. I don't think we disagreed agreeably last time. So I think I, I think that's why we were all kind of offended. And, and I'm proud of us that we kind of kept, didn't say anything then, because if I'd have said something, then it probably would have been totally inappropriate. But I, 
I guess I'm just saying I per encourage us to continue on because we need to work with them. We want to work with them, and we should want to do what's best for all of our students. And I think that's what we want, and I believe that's even what they want. We just maybe are trying to get at it in a different way. So thank you. Melanie. So this is my 11th board meeting, and not even in person. Um, I haven't had the chance to meet a lot of these people face to face. And we've had a lot of these conversations around communications. It's hard to find common ground when you can't stand in front of someone and just have the conversation. It's hard when you're looking at these cameras, and that's the only way to talk to people, right? So I just wanted to chime in that you know, I extended the invitation when we all sat at this table and said, let's get together, let's have these conversations. Um, but I think that we have to work to find common ground because Janet, to, to some of your points, to many of these points, right? I, I think that we want ultimately the same things for our kids. We just have different ways of getting there. And I think that we also have to remember that these meetings don't get the viewership that the conversations across the street do. And so if we're not out there telling our story, and if we're not talking about the things that are important to us in a way that's meaningful to others, then they're not going to hear it. And so we're going to have to take some responsibility for telling that story in a meaningful way. Thank you. Anything else? See, now, well, we will continue this. Quite frankly, I considered because, on, to Betty's point, we didn't answer. I seriously considered resigning as chair the next day. And we'll still do it if that's the, if that's because I felt as I felt like I was an utter failure to let you have to go through that when I'm sitting in the center chair. Uh, that being said, a motion would be in order to approve the consent agenda. <laughs> Dina, oh, did we? We've already approved that. Yeah. Yeah, we've already voted on that. Is there a second? Dina, move. The, Ben, second to the motion. All in favor of the consent agenda, raise your hand. We are going to take recess until 4.40, at which time we will start our deliberation.
order. We're going into, I'm recessing the board meeting and we're going into deliberation. This is different from executive session in that uh, we do not list the time specifically that we're going to be out and the commissioner and our attorney are going to be invited to stay with us through the board meeting. I would anticipate for the purposes of those that are listening that we will be here uh, I'm going to say 30 minutes. If uh, it's going to be much longer than that, uh, then we will reconvene long enough to tell you that it's going to be much longer than that. Uh, Betty is... Oh, she may be back in. Should Peggy be... Are you going to be here? Okay. Okay. So we are, we are now. Uh, as soon as we, as soon as we clear the room, we'll be reconvened and we will be exercising our quasi-judicial function and deliberating, deliberating on the prior PPC uh, matter that you heard oral argument. Um, so I think. What Mark said.
is there a motion? Melanie? I move that the Kansas State Board of Education revoke the license in case 21-PPC-01. Is there a second to that motion? Ben Jones seconds that motion. Any further discussion? Can you hear us, Betty? All in favor of the motion, please raise your hand. All opposed? That appears to be a unanimous vote. I couldn't see for sure what. Did you vote, Betty? Give us a thumbs up or thumbs down. We can't hear you. Okay. Uh, what about now? Can you hear me? Yes, now. Okay. I I did was I did vote to revoke. Okay. Thank you. The uh, okay. The vote was unanimous, and we are in recess until nine o'clock in the morning.